It is this after the meeting. Yeah. It is now 6 p.m. Uh, so we will call our meeting to order. Um, would you join me in a moment of silence? Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to welcome everyone here today. We are always happy to have you with us. Also, I welcome those who are watching us live on the web and later on Access 16. We follow a written agenda and copies are available in front um, on this table and also on our website at salisburync.gov. City Council meetings are broadcast on Access 16. And, and on Hotwire on 394. And on Hotwire 394, thank you, David, our local government TV station. Meeting air times are posted on the station's website, access16.tv, and I'm sure on their website at Hotwire as well. You can also watch current and past city meetings on demand from the city's website, salisburync.gov slash videos. Um, we do have several um, tweaks to our agenda that I would like to go over with council. Um, I am recommending that we change uh, 9 to 9, A, B, and C. And what we're going to do is have Nick Asavis, our Parks and Recs um, director, to come and do a presentation, an update to council. And then we will ask for um, the tennis player um, group's uh, representative to come and make a presentation to council. Um, your limit is 15 minutes. And then we will ask for the pickleball uh, player's representative to come, and you will have 15 minutes. And then we will call Mr. Nick Asavis back up, and council will uh, then go into asking questions or clarifications, and then we will call for a vote on this issue. Um, the other uh, change that we have is we're going to add a resolution of support of the bond referendum for Rowan Salisbury, excuse me, Rowan Cabrera. <coughs> Community College uh, bond referendum, and that will be um, item number 14, and then everything below that will become 15, 14 will become 15, and so on to the end of the agenda. And one last thing, under um, 6, Council is to consider the consent agenda, item number C, uh, authorize the city manager to execute a change order with Atlantic Coast contractors in the amount of 400000 for construction related to phase four of the sanitary sewer rehabilitation project has been removed and will be back on the agenda at a later time. So, <coughs> council, do I hear a motion to adopt the agenda as corrected? So Madam, Madam Mayor. I yes. believe that there was going to be a closed session to discuss personnel and okay. item and to consult with an attorney. Okay. Thank Wherever you. you want to put that on the agenda. Um, at the very end. Okay. So let's make that after 21. So that would be item 22. Right before we adjourn. Right before we adjourn. Yes. So 20, change that uh, 21 to the closed session. closed session. And then 22 will be the adjourn. Thank you. So do I hear a motion from council? So moved. 
We have a motion. All those in favor, aye. Aye. The motion carries. So we will move on to council to consider the consent agenda. Uh, item A is adopt minutes of the special meeting of January 7th, 2020 and the regular meeting of January 21st, 2020. B, adopt a budget ordinance amendment to the FY 2019-2020 budget in the amount of $40,114 to appropriate fund balance for automatic passenger counters. And council has approved that before uh, as far as uh, the item. Um, D, adopt a resolution declaring city council's intent to close a portion of an item of an alley off the 100 block of South Lee Street and set a public hearing for March 3rd, 2020. And um, E, approve a right of way encroachment by level three for the installation of directional board duct on Birdie Avenue per section 11-2427 of the city code. And F, Adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 13, Article 10 of the City Code relating to parking to remove the parking prohibited at all times for portions of the south side of the 200 and 300 blocks of West Franklin Street. So do I hear a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented? So moved. All those in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries. We'll move on to number seven. Council is now going to receive public comment. The public comment will begin following uh, the adoption of the consent agenda. The public sign-in sheet uh, will remain open until the public comment period ends. Um, so I will open the public comment period now. Our Doby. I'd like to thank the mayor and council for this meeting and for the public can attend. I think that's so important to let people know what's on your mind and thoughts. Number one is I'm very proud of the city of Salisbury and getting the city of Lake fixed. That's very important. But also more important is Confederate Avenue. When you're in an ambulance, got a kidney stone, going to the emergency room, you'll think you'll die if you don't get there. Now, it has been, I have brought this up before, and I was promised that they were going to repave it. But I was also told up underneath this here pavement, blacktop, is concrete. And it's going to be hard to do that. But anyway, I'd like to bring that up. They have tried to patch it and they've done a good job, but it's still not like it should. That's number one. Number two is the lighting on uh, Stokes Ferry Road down to Seals Drive, which is in the city of Salisbury. And uh, uh, the lighting is very poor, especially as you get down to the uh, bridge, the creek there where you turn left on Laurel Springs Drive. Okay, number three, at, on Depot Street where the city bus stop is, as you go by there and look and there's no one there, the structure or the glass part or whatever it's made out of glass or whatever the you know, material is, is in real bad shape and it looks real bad when you go by there and see that, it looks depressing. It needs to be cleaned if it can be cleaned or whatever it may be. <clears throat> then I've got one more person I'd like to thank, Ms. Harper. I was standing outside and she said I look lonely and that I need somebody need to come check on me and she did. <laughs> and she let me in and I want to appreciate that. Thank you. And that's all that I have. And thank y'all. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Luann Nording. Good evening, Good Mayor, evening. City Council members. I'm here again. <laughs> um, I know that we have a representative that will be addressing the tennis portion of the pickleball conversion. Um, but I personally went to um, the neighbors in that area. I visited with four neighbors, two neighbors on West Miller Street, gentlemen, and I asked them what their concern might be. Both these gentlemen expressed um, the noise is a huge concern for them. Traffic was secondary for them. And they are, all four neighbors were against the permanent conversion. I spoke with two ladies on North Jackson Street. And both of these ladies, their number one concern was the traffic issue, the safety, the children, the small streets in that neighborhood. So I'm just asking you to consider the neighborhood in that area before um, making <coughs> decisions. I do, if I could leave the mic for a minute, I want to demonstrate something to you. For those of you that do not play tennis or pickleball, may I leave the mic for a minute? I want to say that tennis is a quiet sport. <laughs> um, pretty much, okay. Uh, this is the tennis. I'm not gonna be able to do this. I think you're doing pretty good. Yep. Uh, if you have six tennis courts, all doubles, that's, what, 24 players. If 12 of them are hitting that ball at the same time, that's the quietness of the sport. Tennis players also, um, we just kind of, we're just quiet on the court. <laughs> um, not to say we don't have fun, we do, but this is pickleball. I play pickleball. So, if you have six or 18 in a tournament, pickleball tournament, you'll have 72 players. If 36 of those are hitting this ball with paddles, it's loud. And you can understand why my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well. Thank you. Anyone else? Brian Williams? <clears throat> I didn't bring any props. <laughs> You're welcome anyway. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for your service to our city. Um, I know all of you and appreciate what you do. I know it's not easy at times and it's a lot of requirements on top of already a busy schedule, so thank you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm here to just uh, voice my opinion about tennis. Um, I am pro pickleball. I've played pickleball, I enjoy pickleball, I think it's a really cool sport, and it's a growing sport. Um, however, I'm also pro tennis. I love ping pong, and I love badminton, and I love all racket sports. And I think we have a real opportunity in our city today to do the right thing for our youth, and that's why I'm here. I really tried to get my 14-year-old daughter here to talk on, my, on, on her behalf, although she just chickened out at the end, so I will, voice what she hopefully would have voiced. Um, she's hit on those courts for 10 years, and they've become really dilapidated. Uh, it's, it's, for me, as someone that cares about the sport and cares about our city, it's, a, it's frankly a little bit embarrassing. Um, and I know that there's been uh, a lot of ex, um, forces that have caused that. Economic downturn, cuts, job cuts budget cuts, um, so there's nobody to blame. It's just the reality. But we have an opportunity to revitalize that now. 
And our city used to have eight amazing tennis courts, six at the city park um, and two over at the Civic Center. And today we have zero. Um, we could not have a tennis match. As I'm also a coach at Salisbury Academy, um, and we play, have to play at the country club, which we pay for. And I feel really strange asking parents to buck up 20, 30, 40 bucks per kid to ask them to do that. But that's what we do. And we would love to be able to play at a public facility, which we could at the city courts if they were viable. Um, I assume that North Rowan High School would appreciate that as well, and Knox, because those courts are not <coughs> viable as well. I also hope that we can come together as a community, tennis and pickleball, we're all in this together, and not it be a us versus them, but a we. We have an opportunity to, to, to do something really positive for our entire community here. Um, there's, I, don't, I don't hesitate in saying that. Um, there can be private public partnerships that I've been a part of in the past that could happen with this decision as well. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Light. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Margaret Leib, and I'm a real estate broker with Wallace Realty Company. I represent the Granberries uh, in the sale of their property to Preston Communities, LLC. Um, this commercial tract is located on a five-lane highway uh, that is a connector for three interstates. I 85, 77, and 40. Uh, numerous businesses such as Queen City, uh, Cardinal Tire, uh, Carolina Farm Credit, Salisbury Marketplace, uh, Hendrix Barbecue, Automotive Shop, Godley's, I mean, it goes on and on, are located in this vicinity. Industries on Highway 70 include Freightliner, uh, Grinnell Fabrication, Mueller uh, Systems, um, let's see what else, uh, FCX Terminal, which is the Southern States, uh, Southern uh, Power Rowan, which is the old Progress Energy, uh, and also Schaefer Wood Products. Um, these apartments that are proposed by Preston uh, communities would provide housing uh, for these workers as well as teachers and food line employees at both their stores, uh, warehouses, and uh, headquarters. Um, Rowan uh, Woodland will promote development in this area as the residents will create a demand for more needs and services. The city's 2019 housing study showed that there is a shortage of affordable housing. Um, the Gold Hill Apartments, uh, Brenner Crossing, uh, Woodland Creek, um, the Grand Old Julian, uh, and also uh, the villas at Hope Crest all had waiting lists when I contacted them recently. Um, no, you have 30 seconds. Okay. Preston Development is a private development company that is willing to invest their money in our community. They will provide nice, affordable housing and spur economic growth. I think it would be great for our city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lake, can I ask you a question? Were yes. you speaking to agenda item number eight? Yes. We're going to have a public hearing then as well. So, uh, okay. We, we will have a public hearing then too, but thank you for. Sure. Getting in there, we can make sure we can hear you again. I wasn't sure if it were the appropriate. Yes, ma'am. No, it's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan Crawford. The public hearing. Thank you. 
Emily R Rivers. Hello. Hello. I was looking for a mic, but there isn't one. First, I just want to say thank you. For, it's good to be here tonight, to be at the People's House, and to be able to express some concerns that I'm seeing. First of all, Salisbury has come a long way. We have a ways to go, but it has come a long way. First item, I am very, very pleased to have noticed uh, during the past two years, a police car patrolling my street at least three times a day, every morning at a certain time, when I look out on my street, I can see the officer coming up and down my street at least three times a day. That makes me feel very good, makes me feel very safe. And I hope and I pray that that continues. And I live on uh, Sunset Drive. Now, I have another concern. Um, I was trying to pull it up on my... Um, phone but I couldn't but it is on Facebook and there was a very ugly uh, scene in the beginning of the month uh, with a group of people standing in front of the statue fane uh, with their confederate flag and, and standing there and we all know what that represents we all know the history of Salisbury and um, at this point we've come a long way we have a long way to go and I don't know if you were made aware of that as our, representing our city, but that's not the message that we need to send, and that's not the message, and I don't think people should feel emboldened that they can come here and send that type of message about our city, you know, because we're just a hair from a lot of racial tensions as it is. And so at this point, we've worked so hard to keep our city safe and violent free. Um, you know, it kind of reminds me how they desecrated the, the burial site of Emmett Till, and so much so that they had to make it bulletproof to keep it from being desecrated. I mean, and if that's the case, then, you know, then we, we could line up and say Black Lives Matter. So what I'm saying is it was on Facebook. It's emboldened. Um, here it is, the beginning of Black History Month. And... Um, to me, I just I, it disturbed me very much because we don't need to go backwards. We need to continue going forward. And so, um, Mayor Alexander, I know you are a great humanitarian of people, just like Mayor Higgins. And so, all of you, let's let's be aware of, of those ugly elements out there and let them know Salisbury. We're not going to tolerate that. Let's keep our city safe and keep building it and going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Hombarrier. <laughs> Brought all my stuff with me. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you guys for your service. Um, I'm executive director of local nonprofit Happy Roots. And we manage uh, local community gardens and um, working with Horizons Unlimited and Rowan Salisbury Schools on implementing school garden programs this year. Um, we also practice environmental stewardship. And I'm here on behalf of a lot of people because they have reached out to us about the litter problem. I don't know if anybody's mentioned that lately, but uh, we have, so my family, we pick up litter regularly. Um, we got 11 bags, full bags, in just a quarter of a mile on Majolica Road. And it was there for like two weeks. Rowan Mill Road is worse. Um, Long Street, just certain areas. You know, Town Creek around Walmart is terrible. Um, so we've started a Facebook group called Clean Up Salisbury. And what Happy Roots is doing is um, we want to recognize these outstanding citizens for regularly picking up trash and uh, you know recognize them and I'm hoping to get 
uh, gift cards donated from local restaurants and things that will help, like, give them rewards, you know, for, for helping clean up the city. Um, I'm hoping that the, the city can help promote this and encourage just, like, <coughs> a wide litter sweep because it's really trashy out there. Did anybody else notice it? Do you guys see it? Actually, um, I had a conversation this morning uh, with our uh, public works director, um, Craig Powers, and uh, we were talking about um, uh, expanding a program that they were already working on, uh, and I'm going to be having the fourth graders come through our uh, council chambers, and we're going to do a mock um, council meeting, and uh, litter is going to be the subject. And we're going to ask the fourth graders to help us come up with solutions after they hear a presentation from uh, the conditions that we have that you have so eloquently uh, talked about. Um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, uh, Happy Roots, you know, I teach classes regularly. <laughs> Um, preschool through high school and one of the things we teach is environmental stewardship so it's really cool like you know teaching the young children you know they see it and we want to set a good example um, over Christmas break my preschoolers came back and they were just bragging about how much they you know been helping clean up the, the planet and stuff so um, thank you. that's all I got time for today but thank you thank you so much for all your work love your ideas and actually, she has another 44 seconds yes. the time that you were speaking. Actually, you have more time. You actually have 44 seconds. You have more time yeah. because I took part of your time. So if you um, like, we'll reset the clock for 44 seconds. Hold on. Let me think. Um. <laughs> give, her, give her a minute. About a yeah, minute. Just yeah. give her a minute. Um. You can gather your thoughts. It's starting. Uh, I'm honestly, I, I lost my train of thought. So um, I'm, I'm pretty much good for now. I'll come back. But thank you guys. I just want you to be aware that there were concerned citizens, and we're doing all we can to, um, you know, I know it's a, a short-term solution and uh, just a, a temporary, but just cleaning up after people you know, get sick of picking up other people's trash. So we need to get to the root of the problem and uh, figure out how Patience. people can keep our environment clean. <laughs> well, well, Ashley, thank you so much. I really appreciate Happy Roots and the tremendous work that you do throughout the community. Yeah. Uh, I would just like to say I, I spoke at the last council meeting pretty extensively on this and all the efforts that have been going on. There's a community appearance commission meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. at One Water Street. If people would like to go and sit in that and listen to that group that's really tried to work with parks and with the public services group. We've had two citywide cleanups. We've identified certain streets. I went pretty extensively last council meeting on that. So hopefully that the, the spring clean and the fall clean efforts continue with our four bulk pickups. We also have a neighbor leadership, neighborhood leadership alliance group that tackles this. So we do have some things in place, but Ashley, you're right. The more we can get the word out there, the more hands we have helping to do this. So thank you. Yeah. I just want to add to this. You know, I'm hoping that also we can take a look at how do we help communities that are being dumped in. There are some communities where there are people are going through and they're dumping their trash and leaving their trash. Uh, and so that is another issue that, that, that we're facing. Oh. Yes. Um, someone that lives, also lives on Majolica, said she saw the trash trucks, like when they dump it in, some flies out and it goes down the road and they don't really bother picking it up. That's just, maybe we could remind them, like, I know that's not the best job, but if we can try to keep it. Thank you. Keep it true. Okay. Dylan Horn. <clears throat> Hello, Council and Mayor. My name is Dylan Horn. I grew up here in Salisbury, North Carolina before I went and bicycled around the United States and ended up in Oregon, where I recently finished my PhD in civil engineering. And the reason I came here tonight, I've been keeping up with Salisbury as I've been away for the last 
couple of years, and I saw that there was some interest in creating a bicycle and pedestrian advisory board here in Salisbury. So I was living in Corvallis, Oregon, which uh, if you know anything about Corvallis, they have about 12% of the folks there ride their bicycles every single day as transportation. Bike lanes are on 95% of the roads, and they have an extremely uh, active bicycle and pedestrian advisory board. And I was the chair of that board for the last three years while I was a, a grad student out there. Um, so I wanted to come here today to uh, offer my services to you. Um, I know as you're forming that board or changing the, the uh, Greenway board into that or, or whatever you decide to do administratively, um, I think that I could really be uh, helpful to you during that process to provide some input on how to make uh, a bicycle and pedestrian board effective um, because it's, it's more than just the citizens involved. It's, it's integrating into your parks department, into your uh, public works department, working with the state transportation folks. Um, if you're really going to have holistic solutions to move some of these things forward. Um, and I think that there's, there's a lot of options there and a lot of possibility because I come back to Salisbury and growing up here, um, you know, people, people don't really ride their bikes. And it's really a shame to me because there's such an opportunity to, um, because this is an old city, the, the streets were laid out long before cars. And I think that there's an opportunity that we can uh, make some of those changes to make safer and more accessible streets for, for all folks, um, but especially the vulnerable populations of the people that are walking and biking out there. Um, so um, I filled out the application today on the, for the advisory boards and things, so you can find my information there. Um, and I really am excited about it because I think one of the challenges of, of communities like Salisbury is the brain drain of, of your young people go to somewhere else to live. And for me, I mean, I've gone off and I've done those things and I want to come back here, but I want to be in a place that's nurturing of the way that I want to live. And for me, I ride my bike. So uh, there's, there's all kinds of challenges that, that have to be addressed to really make that holistic from bike parking to safer streets. But I think that those things will help our city be more sustainable for this coming century because uh, for environmental reasons and uh, equity issues and, and economic concerns, um, walking and biking are, are a wonderful way to improve people's quality of life. So I look forward to working with you all. Thank you, thank Dylan, you. and thank you for um, applying. I was going to suggest that. Um, and. So you'll be happy about this. Council has already approved uh, the uh, merging of the Greenway and Bike and Pedestrian uh, Committee. So they're all working together. So we will definitely uh, consider your application. All right. Thank you so much for Thanks. speaking. Thanks. Where in Oregon were you? I was in Corvallis. Corvallis. Yep. So if you look up Corvallis, you'll see me all over the, the newspaper there and stuff for bicycle and pedestrian advocacy work because it, it is much bigger than just the that it's it's about all road safety and and I think that that there's those tragedies are, are so terrible to see but I think they can be prevented if we invest our resources thank you thanks okay <laughs> that um, okay we are um, if we have no others uh, is anyone else interested in speaking at this moment? Okay. We will close the public comment period uh, and move on to item number eight on the agenda. Uh, we will receive a presentation from staff, um, Catherine Garner and Steve Causey of Allied Design. If you'll please come to the desk in front. Yes, yes. Uh, just so that if we have some questions, uh, everything will be on uh, the tape. So, all right. Thank you, Kath. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm excited to present to you tonight CD 03 2019, Burrow and Woodland Apartments. The petitioner is Preston Development Group, represented by Allied Design, um, and the property owner is Mary Granberry. Um, this is located off of Statesville Boulevard in the 2700 block on the south side. Uh, the request is for um, a campus-style residential development, which is multifamily apartments, more than four units per building. 
the zoning ordinance requires that when a uh, development is proposed to have a central drive, um, a central utility system, um, and no primary structure, that it is um, tra tracked through the CD system, so the conditional district route. Uh, there is also a rezoning needed for this one. Mm -hmm. um, the property is currently zoned in three different zones. So the corridor mixed use, residential mixed use, and open space primary. This was something that happened back about 2007, 2008 as an uh, attempt to redevelop the property or develop the property um, in, for a mixed use development. So it's sort of all over the map right now. So the request is to clean it up by only being zoned CMX and then establish the CD overlay on the two parcels. The two parcels would be combined as part of this um, in the engineering review uh, for the development, but it is two parcels being considered. The CD process also allows for the applicant to request some special design um, proposals and criteria. Uh, they do have an alternative proposal on the street elevation of one of the buildings, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So you can see the property here, it's highlighted in blue, the two parcels, um, and then the red is the CMX that's existing, the purple is the RMX that's existing, and the green is the open space primary. So this was part of a larger attempt to develop the property back in the late 2000s. So looking from overhead from Statesville Boulevard, there's an existing house here at the front um, that would be uh, demolished in the central entry to the property would be here off of Statesville Boulevard. And then this is looking to the east towards town. And then towards the west. And then this is the existing house and the existing driveways. So this would be consolidated. This is the proposed site plan as of January 24th. The central the com or the entry right here to the property on Statesville Boulevard, there's just one entry, um, loops through the parking lot, um, and then comes back out to that entrance on Statesville Boulevard. There are 10 residential buildings, one community building located right here, and then several on-site accessory structures for maintenance facilities, garages, and other site features like that. There are two building styles. This is the T-Breeze T1 plan. This is the one that will be right at the front at Statesville Boulevard, so right here. This is the one with the special design criteria that's been proposed as well, the alternative. Um, the ordinance requires that 30% of side elevations that front a street be visible and transparent, either through doors, windows, porches, balconies. Um, but due to the interior layout, that makes that challenging for this development. So for this one facade, they've proposed um, an alternative design, which is a covered patio um, with benches and seating and some additional landscaping to try to soften the, the view and provide an additional amenity for community residents. And so here's the zoomed in view of that, the covered porch with the enhanced pavement benches and some additional landscaping. It, they're still showing being about over 30 feet off of the road, so it's still pretty far back from Statesville Boulevard, but this is the one um, design alternative that the applicant has requested. And then this is front, rear, and side elevations for the rest of the structures that would be towards the back along that circle drive. And then this is front and rear elevations of the clubhouse. This would be when you're coming in on your right. And left and right side elevations as well. They're proposing a pool as part of their uh, neighborhood amenities and recreation open space. Um, all of these buildings and the parking lot will front a central green area. Um, and then these are some of the additional structures that would be available on site as well, including mail kiosk, dumpster enclosure, and a bus shelter. This is the landscape rendering of the site. The buffers do change along the property lines um, as required by the ordinance based on the adjacent um, zoning district. So there is a residential area down here, um, zone general residential, and so the buffer area does increase along the side and rear property lines. However, most of this area is proposed to remain wooded, so it would remain a natural buffer anyways. The proposed development is not inconsistent with Vision 2020 policies. 
specifically policy N16 that new neighborhoods should include one or more neighborhood centers or focal points in each neighborhood planning area. They'll have the community or the clubhouse as well as the central green with walking areas um, in the parking area. And then policy N18, as new neighborhoods are developed, a mixture of housing types, sizes, and prices shall be encouraged within the bounds of each neighborhood planning area. And then policy N19, higher density housing projects such as apartment complexes and condominium developments should be located adjoining places of work, shopping, and public, public transit. Access to higher density housing shall not be through a lower density housing area, and higher density housing may often act as a transitional use between offices or shops in lower density housing. So we've, the planning department has reached out to the transit director, uh, Rodney Harrison, about the possibility of bus uh, service to this site and where the closest bus stop is now. The closest stop is just over a mile down Statesville Boulevard at Lash Drive, so that's quite a trek, but you can get your steps in. Um, there is sidewalk on Statesville Boulevard, so it is possible, um, but a future extension of the service may be possible um, depending on the budget and your directive. Um, but there will be no access from this complex into any of that lower density single family residential so it would be um, buffered with that natural area several acres several acres I believe um, and so there there wouldn't be any cross connection that would be possible through through the automobile planning board held a courtesy hearing on January 14th and voted unanimously to recommend approval as proposed with the alternative design and found that it was not inconsistent with the vision 2020 plan and with that, I'll take any questions that you may have for me. Council, any questions? Uh, you said policy N18. Um, this, this is pure curiosity. A uh, mixture of housing type sizes and prices. Um, I'm just curious what the mixture, what the different, what the range of sizes, prices. I presume they're all apartments, um, so the types won't vary much, but. Size option would be, they are proposing one, two, and three bedroom units. So there would be a range depending on the size of the family unit. Looking square to. footage. Also tonight here is John Cranford on behalf of a Preston development. I may let him dig more, uh, answer more of the questions related to the structure itself, but he's here with me and he'll be up. And okay. uh, the square footages range from 725 to uh, 1150. What's the price range? Uh, Eight fifty to thirteen hundred, depending upon unit. Remind me, it was at the very beginning. How many units are there? I'm sorry. Uh, it would be two hundred and forty units total, and we have a general mix um, of one, twos, and threes. I don't know what the mix is right off the top of my head. Should be a breakdown on the plan sheet. That'd be right. I, I appreciate it. Any other questions? There's, there's rental rates for this market rate. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask about with 240 um, units there, um, what are are we concerned about a stoplight or a, you know how how do how are we dealing and what do our policies say in regard to that, Catherine? And Catherine, can you go back to that slide that shows it beside the other one? I, with what you're saying, Karen, I think that would help me see that too. Yeah. Uh, the aerial. Back one more. Whoops. Yeah, right there. So we have been in conversation, or the applicants have been in conversation with North Carolina DOT about what kind of improvements would be required. Um, I don't know that they have required a light yet. I think they're talking perhaps a taper. Uh, taper lane within the right of way and things like that, but they we have been in conversation with DOT They've come to the pre-application meetings. We've had about this project. So they're very aware of what's going on and um, The developers are working with DOT regarding that driveway permit and what may be required I think I saw that there was a right in right out condition so mm -hmm. that the traffic light I And mean, if you're going right in right out, it shouldn't be much of an issue 
quick word about that. We did come in initially and ask for a full access turning left in, left out, right in, um, and we're told no. So um, you're right, there's a median that exists there today. That will remain in place, and it will only allow right in, right out. Um, anticipated traffic pattern would be to go to the signal and U-turn. That was factored into their decision making, and they didn't see any um, negative consequences. Later. And that is four lanes at that point, yes, the road is. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that it had been addressed. So if DHT Actually, is it's in... It's almost five because there's a turn lane there. There's a turn lane up at the light. And if DOT has been involved from the beginning, they're not going to let you do anything that's not safe. So, And it sounds like a lot, but department's uh, trip generation is around a little over five, nearly six trips a day, and it calculates to about 1,400, but that's an AM, PM. It's coming and going, and you break it down on an hourly basis. I just don't think it was significant. You have plenty of capacity, was my understanding, out on uh, Statesville Boulevard. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions from council? Okay. Well, with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next on our list will be to open um, a public hearing to hear from anyone in the public. Um, in support of or in opposition to this project. So <coughs> opening the public comment period. So anyone? Yes, so I have a question. Um, yes, um, so anybody? Oh, I got a call. We have to hear you yes. in the mic. Yeah, we, we have, have to, to hear, you, hear in the you in the mic. Yes. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> oh, Lord. You are in a very safe space. You're fine. I'm just, I know. I just, oh, God. Oh. <laughs> okay, so um, just a curious question about the driveway that, you know, about demolishing the house. Um, Does anybody stay there in the house that you guys are talking about, like demolishing? There's no. Okay, that was just my question. I was just curious about that. Like, I just wanted to know because I tried to put myself, like, in that position, like, and I didn't know how it worked, so. Just a curious question. But thank you, guys. Young people. Very good question. Uh, good question. Yeah. Great question. Do, do we need thank to get you. her name? <laughs> um, dear, would you mind uh, coming back up for just a minute and state your name for the record? Yeah, that's okay. That's right. We're we're <laughs> delighted to have you. Uh, but I'm Shania Scott. I go to uh, Livingstone College, okay. social work major, yes. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Now you're experienced, so you can come back. <laughs> okay. Now you're experienced, so you can come back regularly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello. <clears throat> I'm Dora Boyes, and I am not against all four. I just want to bring out my concerns or my what I want to be taken into consideration. Um, the price, the cost that I had frightened me and I'm wondering how they come about because if if the desire is to have low-income people live there how is the low-income average in Salisbury been taken into consideration in how the rent is determined because 700 and 800 is frightening to me and I, my mortgage is lower than that. And I think I get a little bit more of a cushion from my pay job, but still I am pinching pennies and I'm just considering a person who doesn't, who is not getting that amount of money would do. So I would like it to be taken into consideration how the rent is actually determined, taking into consideration our average pay, the jobs that we have in source, if that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then another thing which always concerns me is that I would like to know the percentage of people who, or the original, people who were in Brenner Crossing, the percentage of those people who are still there. Does that make sense to you what I'm trying to get at? And so because I'm afraid that we will build these places 
to bring new people in and not actually solving the problem of our own people who have lived here for a long time. And I applaud the whole concept, but I don't want it to be full of injustices. But thank you. Anybody else who would like to speak in favor of or in opposition? Okay. We will close the public hearing and I will con turn it over to Council for your consideration and any questions. Thank you. And we may call back one of you. Uh, but we'll wait and see what the questions are from council. So, <coughs> just to address the questions that were asked, uh, the young lady's question about uh, is somebody living in the house? Uh, you know, obviously, before this development can happen, whoever owns the property has to be willing to sell it to the person who's going to develop it, and that would indicate that they're willing to do so if they've already had this conversation and they want to go forward. So, uh, it might be a good day for them if they can sell their property for this purpose. So, again, that that answers your question. Um, we don't root, not down people's houses without their permission. That's just not how that works. So that's a good question, though. It, it's a very good question. Uh, but that, that's how that works. Um, relative to the, the question about rent levels, uh, first of all, city council doesn't set rents. That's not what we do. We make a decision based on zoning. We make a decision based on, in this case, campus style and whether or not the amenities that are part of this proposal meet the criteria of the zoning. We don't set rents. Um, secondarily to that comment, though, there is a, an equation that the developer is going through, and that is what's it cost to do this development and what kinds of rents do we have to earn from the development to make sure we can cover the cost of building it. Um, so there, there is an element of market rate that's a part of that. We do have in Salisbury quite a few facilities that are uh, subsidized rent properties and that's why I asked the question about market rate I was curious where this fits into the, the inventory um, we, we have multiple uh, locations where that is part of the design of that program or that development and and in those situations there's a situation where um, either lower rates are offered in, in the development construction financing to allow them to get lower rates uh, or there's some other structure that might be in place. The bottom line in this case, we don't dictate to a developer which one they choose. We just vote on the zoning piece. So uh, to the concern Ms. Boisengo mentioned, it's, it's a valid concern, and affordable housing is a concern we have to always pay attention to. But again, we don't dictate that. We just respond to development opportunities as they occur. So I don't know if that answers your question, ma'am, but uh, in, in this particular case, I'm focused on the zoning and whether or not it's appropriate from that standpoint. And uh, that's how I'll be making my decision. Any other questions from council? Uh, do we have any information on the percentage of low-income units uh, that are still available at Brenner Carlson? Because I know the city did participate in that project at some point. Uh, and even though the council does not set um, rates and rents and communities, councils and local governments and counties can certainly participate in how do we bring about affordable housing for its citizens and its residents so so that everyone has a place to live. I mean, housing is just a, a, a fundamental right. It's about basic dignity. I don't have a number on how many units are available at Brunner Crossing. Mm -hmm. To your question about um, affordable housing projects that may be in the pipeline, we are aware of several. One that will be coming before you probably as early as next month. Okay. Um, and we have had calls about other projects. So it is still, there are developers who are interested in that, and we are aware of that. But I don't know that that's part of this proposal tonight. We can, I think we can get that information <clears throat> when we're crossing. I don't recall those numbers, but I think the last time I looked at it, there were more or as many after the development as there were before. But let me, let's see if we can get that information to you. Thank you. I think Civic Park had a hundred uh, had 155, and I think there were more, but it's. Um... I think that they actually <coughs> had to meet that for their um, getting the tax credits. It was part of the um, requirement when they did their North Carolina financing 
uh, through the fi North Carolina Financing Agency, they were able to get tax credits because they were going to provide X amount over a long period of time. So that's generally how that project is set up. Um, and we've got other projects that have come and wanted to do affordable <coughs> housing, and they were using the North Carolina financing model, <coughs> which gave them certain tax credits. Um, but this particular project, as I'm understanding it, you're not getting any special financing through the North Carolina financing. No, we're self-financed. You're self-financed. So you're, this is a market rate to um, Mr. Miller's point. Um, so, okay. Any other questions? I have, I have one question, which you may know the answer to, with, which was when the Civic Park apartments were demolished for Brenner Crossing, weren't all the residents there given first right of occupancy at Brenner Crossing? Yes. Wasn't that, they had if that, they, they had the first. they were still in the area, and if they met the uh, financial, uh, you know, their credit ratings, and criteria. I mean, there was criteria that was established, so they, they were given first right of refusal during that project, but there still had to be a certain number of those units that continue through um, the, I think it's like a 25-year finance um, uh, schedule, uh, and we can find out that those specifics. It's important to note that the city doesn't own that or operate. Yeah, that we don't own or operate crossing it. piece, and that really isn't the issue in front of us today either. Um, what we're here to talk about today is this particular development. <coughs> I would uh, agree to that, although it's important that we are paying attention to all that housing piece. Catherine, I would just make a request. If we could, although it's not directly in our purview, it, its own things that we're responsible for as good stewards, if we could find out some of that information. Also, what is our need? not just what's available, what is our need? That way we're doing better at fair housing. Uh, however, with Allied Designs today in front of us, uh, I do have a question. Um, this is about the zoning. What are the next steps after that? What happens after that? <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand what you mean by next step. I mean, when we approve the zoning, are there other steps that need to occur? Yes. Yeah. So, or if we deny the zoning, we know what happens there. But if we approve it, what are the follow-up steps? If it, if you were to approve the rezoning tonight, then Preston Development and the Allied Design would submit construction documents, and they would go through the construction review to make sure they're meeting all applicable city ordinances, utility ordinances. They will need to annex into the city limits to for the water and sewer connections. That would be forthcoming. Um, they wanted to wait and make sure that they were given the rezoning before they completed that on the off chance that they weren't. Um, then uh, we would issue zoning permits once all conditions have been satisfied and then construction could begin. Thank you. And I'm curious, you know, as a city, what kind of incentives do we give developers when they're coming in so that they can keep their, you know, costs as low as possible? I mean, maybe that's a public discussion and something that we need to. More than happy to listen. <laughs> He's not getting it. Happy to listen. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 we do like those as yeah. well. Let me just say, we're yeah. happy to have the developers who do their own self financing, and that it doesn't take away taxpayer resources to give incentives. So that's a great thing too. Well, and, and but I just want to point out that everybody who lives here is a taxpayer, whether they're making five hundred thousand dollars or making five thousand dollars. You know, they're all taxpayers. And so as a local government, if we can participate in, in some kind of a program or some kind of partnership in which we can help developers who want to provide quality housing, uh, that's a good thing for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. To that point, did you get any incentives from city or county for this, from any government? No, no incentives. Um, I can tell you I've built, I built all over the state of North Carolina, and this is one of the better communities I've dealt with in terms of being development not friendly but the process has been very easy and it's 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 the one stop sorry, shop repeat, works could you repeat that for me yeah. yeah i mean it works yeah it works so i mean it's 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 always nice to, to, to develop in a community that seems to be welcoming this thank type you. of development thank you for saying that any other questions from council otherwise i will ask for council's 
decision on this in the form of any motion that you would like to? I know we've had a few questions. I'll go ahead and state for the record that I'm in favor of the uh, of approving, and I would be happy to make a motion unless there's other further comments. Moving forward, then, the city hereby finds and determines that adoption of an ordinance to rezone the two parcels described herein from corridor mixed use, residential mixed use, and open space primary to corridor mixed use district and establishing a conditional district overlay for the parcel is reasonable and in the public interest. The proposal is fundamentally consistent with the Vision 2020 Comprehensive Policies N16. New development should include a neighborhood center and focal point. Policy N18. A mixture of housing types, sizes, and prices shall be encouraged within the bounds of each neighborhood planning area. And policy N19, access to higher density housing shall not be through a lower density housing area. Therefore, I move to adopt an ordinance amending the land development ordinance and the land development district map of the city of Salisbury, North Carolina, resigning two parcel, rezoning, excuse me, two parcels from the quarter mixed use, residential mixed use, and open space primary to quarter mixed use and to apply conditional district overlay to subject parcels approximately 21.535 acres located at 2715 Statesville Boulevard establishing a conditional district overlay to permit the development of a 240 unit multifamily residential campus style apartment development we have a motion all those in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed okay. unanimous thank you Especially thank you for the friendly comment about our development office. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, council is to receive an update regarding the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board discussion regarding pickleball pickleball court conversion. Um, Nick Asavis, thank you, and your staff, Tony Smith, and. Terry and uh, Terry Shaw with City Park Recreation <coughs> Center and Sam Wilborn, our Recreation Program Manager, are also here. Um, so, what we were going to do was give you a quick update from the um, November Advisory Board meeting, and it was discussed again uh, about this project. Um, and then I know that um, both the tennis group and then the pickleball group are going to present. So, we'll go through this kind of quick, and then. Any questions after they present, we can come back and answer any questions, concerns, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, staff brought up the uh, topic, of course, for discussion again back in November to, to receive a final vote. It's been discussed uh, over the year, past year, multiple times, originally in 2018, August of 2018. Uh, and then it was discussed again in the fall of 2018 as well with no opposition from the board. We brought it back up in November uh, just to kind of have a final vote to bring it back to council to try to get um, uh, a final decision on the project either way for us so we can move forward either with the project or, um, or, or, or you know, so we can move on to other projects in the department. Um, they, they discussed with us, uh, we discussed with them, the staff provided the pros and cons. Uh, the Parks and Rec Board uh, had an open discussion about all the options that we displayed that we gave to them about converting or not converting. Uh, and the options discussed were returning the funds and leave the courts as is, uh, with a reminder um, that the courts still need to be resurfaced. Um, we do understand that uh, what's, uh, in what condition that the courts are in, uh, we have requested um, capital expenses since 2014-15 to, that was prior to me coming as well, uh, to improve the, the court surfacing. Um, uh, or we discussed moving forward with the court conversion, uh, which would replace two of the, the courts uh, on the end, one and two, to um, make them permanent pickleball courts, which we've discussed in our public meeting and our advisory board meetings about making them as convertible as possible because we would still leave up <coughs> the tennis nets there. They would not be removed. Uh, or build a new facility at another location like Civic Center or, or anywhere else like that. Um, the results and discussion, uh, just due to our infrastructure needs, it was, you know, as you can see, it's voted unanimously to move forward with the conversion to serve as many residents with as many programs as possible. Uh, this is kind of in line with the master plan discussion 
about infrastructure improvements that we need to make, also looking at our budget challenges this year um, and moving forward with the budget challenges uh, as we go through the years, as discussed at the recent retreat, uh, some of the issues we have, at least in Parks and Rec and across the city as a whole. Um, and it was also staff, especially staff, but a board's recommendation that a new facility would not be fiscally responsible. We feel like if we built a new facility at any cost, that money would be better suited to um, whether, you know, tonight's vote is to convert or not to convert. Regardless of that, uh, we feel any money that's going, that would go towards that project would be better suited to fix Fred M. Evans' pool. Uh, the floor at Hall Gym needs desperately to be replaced. Um, and uh, the numbers, we pull all the numbers just to kind of, uh, we can give later if needed uh, to kind of use it at Hall Gym. Um, but uh, that was basically what was discussed. Um, and we can ask any questions now, answer any questions now, or when after they present, come back up, answer any questions. Can you leave your options page up? Yes. Just for reference. Thank you. Yeah. So did you go over this? I'd like you to go over this options discussed. Yeah. So, um, so the with returning the funds, if we kept it. So the course need to be resurfaced regardless. Let me just throw that out. So let's say we go with a conversion. There are going to be four courts remaining. Those still need to be resurfaced. Um, what, what cost? If we got a USTA grant, now USTA grant has a, has a tie to it. USTA grant give you for four to 11 courts, you can get up to $20,000. Um, to Total or those. per court? Total. Per, per court, uh, it's about 40 grand, roughly 10 grand, depending on the, the, uh, the bid type of year. Um, we've we've guesstimated about sixty thousand every year. Requested between it's fluctuated between forty four and sixty thousand in request. Um, what are the criteria about getting the the U.S. tennis grant? You can apply. You need a match. You need to. They don't fund it a hundred percent. The other requirement is you have to have youth lines. And I know there were some uh, when we brought that up. There was some discussion that. Uh, some in the tennis community didn't want the youth lines on the on the court. But it's a requirement of the. It is a requirement, and that was confirmed today. We called USTA again just to confirm for the, you know, again, uh, and and they confirmed that. So and that they don't fund at a hundred percent. USTA started a program to, to help kids called Smart Start, and it uses a different size net and a different size racket and a different size ball than tennis, and so and a different size court. So on the tennis court, you also have to have a second set of lines anyway. Because it's got to be smaller. It's got to be smaller. you got to have a separate net, which is usually, um, I think it, it's also a portable net because you bring in another net. Um, and do blended lines on the current nets, but the line issue has been brought up before. One of the po opposition to pickleball is that the lines that are on the court or even merging pickleball with, and we looked at various ideas on how to do it. Uh, the blended lines could sit there on top of the current existing lines as well. Okay. Um, but just uh, some uh, with the if you went, if we went forward with the conversion, some of the pros um, was just an additional amenity to uh, our citizens for a fast growing <laughs> sport um, at uh, no cost to to our department. Um, we save on maintenance costs because again we're not building a separate facility. Um, as far as it being an additional cost, we'd still have to maintain this facility regardless. But if we go to another facility, we're not maintaining and paying for, for utilities and et cetera. Um, we think it'll be increased park usage. Uh, probably one issue with no traffic right now is the lack of the usage of the park. Uh, even if we revitalize tennis, that would increase traffic. Um, so we feel, and, and we, don't, we do know there's limited parking there. That's another issue for us that we can't solve tonight. But regardless of whatever program we go and becomes whatever and the usage increases, traffic's going to increase. For us, we hate to see the traffic, but that means people are in the parks, and that's what we're here to do is get people in the parks. Um, and with our existing budget, we're looking at any way we can to increase those opportunities. Um, obviously, the cons, if we go forward, we lose two tennis courts. Um, and, uh, but again, like I said, the other four courts will still need, need to be updated um, and call that a con or a pro because it still needs to be done regardless. Uh, 
The other option of uh, resurfacing um, the tennis courts and then building pickleball facility, the overall cost. You know, you can get up to about 300 grand spending to revitalize this facility, building a separate facility. Uh, then there's added maintenance for public works to have to maintain both courts. And then in five to seven years, you're resurfacing two facilities at double the cost. And that's a, that's a reoccurring cost over the, year, over the years. Um, but uh, what it would do, a pro, a pro to building a separate facility, I'll give the pros even though we're kind of against building a separate facility, is it's, an, it's a separate amenity. Um, for users, you can host a premier pickleball tournament if you build enough a big enough facility, and it could possibly generate some great revenue. Um, and if it went somewhere like Civic or somewhere like that, it'd be close to the interstate, so just it would be convenient. Uh, but um, so I've talked about the cons for that uh, option: utility costs, strain on maintenance, maintenance costs, etc. Then option three is, you know, of course, uh, not moving forward. Um, excuse me. Option uh, one is not moving forward. Uh, the pros um, is that uh, the lack of parking will not be impacted. Courts one and two will be available for tournaments, of course. We'll be able to have all, all those courts there. The cons, uh, again, uh, all the courts need to be resurfaced, of course. Um, we feel at this point the utilization is not theirs. If you add in another group, it's going to just pump up that utilization. Um, but it also require if we kept the temporary lines there, pickleball players would still have to bring their own nets in. So it doesn't give a child, um, which pickleball is a cheaper sport to play, um, the opportunity just to walk on and play. They'd have to go when a net was already set up by somebody else. I've got a few questions. Uh -huh. So when you were talking about the um, USTA grant, but one of the um, pieces that is required is that you have the lines for the youth You've got to have the youth lines. Are the youth lines and the pickleball lines the same or um, different? There, well, the, the, there's a kitchen. <laughs> yes, there's a kitchen they're and different. pickleball. They're okay. different. Okay, yeah. so, so they're different. So, okay. yeah, so the okay. insides, yeah. Okay. And so the other thing I think I'm hearing is that if we do convert the two tennis courts into the pickleball courts, we're still going to have four tennis courts that look awful that aren't going to have any attention to them. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that they will need, yes, they need a dressing. So we'll have two pickleball courts that can be used, but four tennis courts that, in essence, really can't be used. Well, we already have, right? Yeah. Six. yeah. We, we would have six pickleball courts, because you can fit six pickleball courts in the and same area that courts. you can fit two tennis courts. Okay, okay. We would leave the tennis nets up, because mm -hmm. um, we'd always convert back to tennis. Okay. okay. Um, the other four courts would be as they are today. But our, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that even today, we still need to resurface those four courts. If we move forward with this, those courts still need to be addressed at some point just because of the cracks in the court, et cetera. And what do you think has um, contributed to the fact that we don't have a lot of tennis traffic that you talk about? Is it, when, when did we have a lot of tennis traffic? Did the city at that time have programming around tennis? When I came in in 2015, mm -hmm. The numbers were already down, much like adult softball. Adult softball is now almost obsolete mm -hmm. um, because for us, what we see it as is, is um, the interest. Now, the people playing the sport, people playing softball, people playing tennis tell us, oh, no, everybody likes to play this. Mm -hmm. What we have to look at is um, numbers. So we looked at scanning cards. We scanned cards to get in at the, um, at the tennis court. And... Just in the month of August of 2019, we had 115 scans to get onto the court. Now, I could scan and let all of you in, but the, what we have to go by, because we can't afford to have a staff member there um, signing people in, is we have to sometimes go by those scans. Now, that could be pickleball. It could be tennis. We get, they scan in, and they get in. <coughs> now, that same month, um, Hall Gym had 1,603 visits. So that kind of So where we're coming from is... The usage now before uh, to answer your first question before that uh, we had an instructor that was here before and then we got a new instructor prior to me coming um, Terry's done some programming well I was going to say much like all of our programming is instructor based we don't have a staff that is dedicated to teach tennis mm -hmm. so with any programming once you contract somebody um, we rely on their expertise and their what they're comfortable with teaching and doing um, and I know prior to Nick coming, 
it's been a, it had been a change in our instructor. So with that, that impacted what programs we could offer for tennis. And, and so not having the programming or maybe the instructor do the programming, whatever the case may be, has impacted some of those numbers where we possibly had higher numbers at one point with the tennis. So the programming is connected to, or the lack of programming may be connected to the lower numbers. Well, yeah, but we have had an instructor out there, uh -huh. it's the same way we do with Zumba and all of our other programs. So they're out there, they're kind of, they are contracted, um, there's someone who contracts with us to help us with these programs. They help us push the programs. Uh, we advertise for the programs through social media um, and our playbook. Um, we've done, we've tried to put on um, low cost camps for children who maybe can't afford the normal tennis lessons. We put those on uh, at a very low rate, five dollars, um, and we're just trying to find traction. We've reduced uh, the fee for the tennis instructor to try to give that person more latitude and flexibility to offer more programming. Um, uh, and, he, and that person is being paid by the public, correct? In addition to what we're paying them. We, well, we that's we the thing, we, we're not paying them. The well, only they're getting that income from their correct. students, but they're being able to use our facilities. And do they pay a They paid a, a, a monthly permitting fee to allow them access to the course. Um, the it's only their business. Right. Correct. That's how it was before, but we lowered the cost to try to improve mm -hmm. the numbers out at the facility. I didn't know how it worked. So the only additional pay that we covered is with the camps because it was a little different so that we could keep that cost low. Then it was agreed amount of what we would pay that instructor for that week of camp. Okay, for a camp. Yes. And those were for students that wouldn't be able to afford to pay the Well, the camps, we, we've done some camps that um, we try to target that demographic and then with our regular summer camps is open to anyone but we're the hope is at that cost that we could bring in um, those kids that may have some interest in tennis but don't want to pay the you know the out per hour rate but it gives them that exposure and this is our department where we need I mean honestly it goes back to money I'm sorry but it, we need revenue and we took the dive on revenue to increase to try to increase the participation you know, going from three thousand dollars a year to six hundred dollars a year, twenty four hundred doesn't sound like much. But when I can go into finance office and say we got three grand, it it makes the case that maybe we could get a little more expenditures. But we did that to try to stoke um, the interest in the program. Um, and even with the Rotary tournament, we don't. It's one of the only tournaments that we don't charge. We never charge them a fee. We set up tables. We set up tents. That's something we would do for any other tournaments. The tournaments we have out at the community park. We charge a fee we don't provide those services because it is a revenue generator but this is for us to say hey how can we make it more successful we're going to try to eliminate as many barriers as possible um, the, the rotary tournament last one attracted about 65 people and raised about a thousand dollars but the thousand dollars did not come to the city it went to the rotary club so they got the use of the facilities they also use catawba college and the country club for, for that tournament as well and in fact it was situated the check-in and where you got your matches was at Catawba rather than at City Park. The last one, which was two years ago, there wasn't one last year, and there's none on the schedule for this year. So the city donated the, the tennis courts to the Rotary Club? Yep. Yeah, so the usage of, instead of normally she'll get a rental fee, we, we don't charge, we would not charge them the fee to, to be able to host that tournament. Just but it was a fundraiser for them? Yes. Yep. Hmm. Catawba charged them. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know that we offered free use of facilities to anyone for a fundraiser. I mean, I, I didn't. That was something that when we came in, when I came in, it was already in place. And we never put the, you know, we never added the barrier or added the fee to, to the event. We still do that? They, they don't have, currently. It hasn't they happened. It anymore. They haven't had enough people. and There's no tournament last year or this year. I'm fine with so these. The tennis community hasn't had a uh, <coughs> a tennis tournament in the last two years. That one tournament. That one tournament. Yeah, yeah that, 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 just, that. They've had other tournaments, but just not that one. Okay. There hasn't been any tournament. No, no. It used to be the Cheerwine tournament, if you back up. I mean, my brother will know the answer to this, but probably 10, 12 years ago, it was called the Cheerwine, did some sponsoring. 
and then Rotary took it over. Um, and so it's the only tournament we have here, have or had. Okay. So one last question I've got. Um, courts need to be resurfaced. What you're advocating for, what the board, Parks and Rec Board has, our commission has, has given back to us, is that we convert. I'm just summarizing to make sure everybody's on the same page because I've, I've heard, I got an email from someone in my neighborhood that says, don't take those six courts and turn them into to pick up. That's not what we're talking about. There are six courts that exist today, six tennis courts. What's proposed is that two of them be repurposed to six pickleball courts, which would leave, at, at the end of that conversion, six pickleball courts and four tennis courts. Is that correct? Correct. All of the surfaces there need to be re refurbished. Uh, yes. And so is your proposal just to simply convert the two courts or to resurface and repair and get everything up to where it needs to be? <clears throat> Or is that to be determined in our budget? I'll take all of it getting resurfaced. I'll just say that because it needs to be done. Right. We don't have it in the current budget capacity to do any of it without the opportunity that was presented to us. Right. So. And what was that opportunity? It was a donation to convert the courts to pickleball courts. It's something that we had talked about. It's been a it's been a program that we've known. It's been in our industry going years back, and it was on our list of things to eventually see if we could either at a uh, facility somewhere at the time, past couple years, um, or uh, how do we incorporate it more? But it wasn't on the list of things. Now, um, it presented itself as an opportunity for us to not have to spend a dollar, and we were able to look at a facility that wasn't in high use. Uh, three courts at a time were being used. We had some that were not being used. So we thought, hey, this is a great time. There's a lot of demand for it. Uh, it's something that we can do. It can increase an in opportunity, um, whether people like it or not. You know, it did kind of really became popular um, in the active older adult community, um, and now younger kids are playing it, um, and we think more would play if there were permanent nets out there. Um, so, so to finish that question, then, if you, regardless of the donation that's been received, um, how much would it cost to resurface all six courts? No, you've got enough to cover two. If they're pickleball, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, regardless of any donation or anything. about forty to fifty thousand, but we think we could get a grant to cut that half. But I don't want to promise the total that. cost for for all six existing courts, regardless of what configuration they're in, would be about fifty grand, roughly well, twenty twenty five do that's been donated and forty from the city, <clears throat> sixty five total. 65 but if you're total. saying the city's commitment, it would be about forty five to fifty. Yeah. Okay, so let's just say seventy five on the outside, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and just to confirm, we've got a $25,000 donation, right? Um, I think it's probably wise that we disclose what that is. Um, and I'll let you do that. Um, yeah, well, there are several donors, and we've donated 25 And after two years, my bet is the costs have gone up, and the, the donors have agreed to cover whatever the additional costs are going to be. It makes sense to me, and I'm just throwing in this out here that if we do decide and I'm not saying the decision is made but if we do decide to do regardless of what we do we need to fix these courts because yes. to your point about programming another reason why usage may be going down is condition of the courts mm -hmm. and so that is a need that we need to address regardless of what we, de we decide I would add this just for your because you probably haven't gone to look at the courts and watched you know the the prior pros out there but they don't use the pros the, the best the courts in the best conditions are courts number five and six what's being converted is courts one and two uh so the the best courts number six and usually the pro out there is on number six <coughs> for right now so just so you're aware of that and um is and i do know and i don't know if they're going to hire him but there is uh, a professional that was alluded to in an email <coughs> uh, uh, who's who's been a pro in salisbury for years and is applied for this position again um who is also becoming a certified pickleball pro so that he can teach kids i mean th this sport's also attracting a lot of kids and the cost of pickleball is a whole lot less than the cost of tennis and there is demand you know in the community for that as well so there but you could have multiple programming if you do the conversion both tennis and pickleball programs for young children well, well what i want to what I have an issue with, and I just want to be clear about this, and I hope I say this in the right way, 
is that as a public entity, as a local government that's dealing with public funds, I don't want to set a precedent where we begin to put public money with private money because the private money has a priority and something that's important to them. And so when we're talking about these, these courts that are out there, um, there's a priority from private dollars to have pickleball. And so because we're going to put in some money for the pickleball, we want the city to put in some public money to help resurface the courts, but then we're going to leave the other four tennis courts as are. So, so I, I struggle with that unless we're going to have money. That's not no. that, that's what, I, what I heard him say is that uh -huh. pickleball's been a priority and that someone's come forward and, and offered to help right. fund it. Well, I think your question is, the, if, if, so the private dollars would mm -hmm. go towards, yes, converting the two to six pickleball. Right. The other dollars that we would spend would go to fixing the other four courts. So then that means the whole facility is. So the whole facility yeah. would be done. Okay, okay. Well, that's I'm, what I was trying to pull out. Okay. Yeah. okay. That, that's what I was saying earlier. Okay. Like, we still okay. have to address those. Because at first I thought I was hearing that we're going to have these six pickleball courts, you know, from these two, and then these other four tennis courts are going to be left. No. Because when you kept talking about it, we still need money to resurface. Right, and that's like in the board, our advisory board as well keeps saying the same thing, like we've got to address the court condition. So do we have the money in the budget right now to resurface those other four courts? We do not have it in the current budget, no. So then that goes back to my original place. Then we're going to have two courts that get converted to six pickle courts that are ready and resurfaced. But then we're still waiting to resurface these four tennis courts, right? So then we have inequity. Is that right? Okay. Well, until we come up with the money in the budget to take care of those four tennis courts, then we have inequity. Well, and I would say this, mm -hmm. that the, I think that we're all interested in sort of having a win-win situation yes. here is the way that I think about it. So if we have, a, we have donors, dub, double donors, we have Mr. Post who happens to be on council, but he's giving money for the public's use of a pickleball facility. He may play on it, and so, and Mr. Post is a member of the board of... John Post. John Post is a member of the Parks and Recs board. He is one of the other donors. They are giving money for the public good to, for not only them to play on it, but for hundreds of other pickleball players to play on it. So I want to make that clear. I, I mean, for me personally, I don't see that as being a negative. I mean, I don't think that the city should look down on any, and I would encourage the tennis community to find 10 donors that can come up with and help offset it. And I mean, that, that would be wonderful. I don't think we should ever, like, denigrate any philanthropy that we can get. I mean, we need, and we've just said in our goal setting meeting that we want partnerships. We need partnerships. It's the only way that a small government and municipality like our own can do the work that we do throughout this community. Well, I don't think anyone's denigrating public dollars. I mean, I mean, private dollars that are coming in to partner with the local government. I don't want to lose sight of equity and what that looks like in a community. Because visually, when you go by there and you have six new pickleball courts that look really great, and then you have these four still need to be resurfaced tennis, tennis courts, that is a bad visual. And so if we're going to be moving forward with this project, I think we need to be having some, some really creative conversations about how do we make the whole thing work. And I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I think well, Nick I said think... that he's wor wanting to work with um, Mary James Miller, in terms of the U.S. Um, tennis group that is willing to give it, but the criteria that is that we, yes, the grant. And then that would leave, if we could do that, then the city could match 20000 of that extra money. Is that what I'm understanding you're saying? It would about need, the, need to be a match. It would need to be a match. Mm -hmm. So if we could come up with, out of our city budget, by not doing something else, 20000 and have that be the match for the tennis grant with the stipulation that, of course, you would have the 
youth lines, which should be something that the, the tennis community would support widely because I've heard them say they want it to be a continuing sport, and the only way that can happen is to have the youth be a part of it. And you're talking about supporting the tennis pro before um, Ms. Shaw uh, with um, camps for students who can't. So I think we could create a win-win situation here. If the Tennis Court Association is, you know, willing to, to go into that, have the youth lines on there, and then we, as council, can we then go through and help to get the matching funds. And then I think we have a win-win-win situation. Have we applied for the grant? We don't have a match, so we don't we, we I have done the initial letter of interest, but because we don't have the match, uh, we can't go forward. But one thing we do is if we have a match, there is, and this is always because it's all grants, but if we got that grant, there's also a Southern grant and a North Carolina grant that might be an additional 10000 But you have to secure, we want to make sure we have um, a match because I don't want to, I try not, we try not to just apply for grants and then go to finance and say, hey, we need a match for this grant. We want to make sure that we have a good foundation to go forward with the. I think it's so, so to get that match, so, uh, Mr. Bailey and, and Mr. Seves, to get that match, what you would need to hear from council is let's find that $20,000. Well, I is, mean, we, I we mean, can. Is it, is it that simple? I, I need I mean, to know because if, if we, we have don't a, have the match, have, yeah, then it's a match. moot point about the grants. I, I right. think what I've heard Mr. Seves say mm -hmm. is if you were to give him $20,000 for whatever with no strings attached, mm -hmm. I don't know that he would put it for pickleball or tennis courts. I think he would use it at Hall Gym where you have a whole lot more use than anything else and some of our other facilities where there's a greater need. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, as we talked about earlier today, the budget, the, the pie is so big, and, and if you're mm -hmm. cutting off, either taking it from somewhere else, if you do that, or you've got to make it bigger, and, and, and that in, involves additional revenue coming in from the city, whether it's taxes or something else. So then we may not ever have the match. But, <laughs> so, right, and so I all I can do is request it in the budget process. Right. And then it's up to the budget process to determine what's funded. Right, I mean, right. so see, we, the, we, we've, uh, we've requested $800,000 in capital improvements, yeah, but understanding yeah. that the, the budget is what it is, yeah. you know, if, if it all gets cut, it gets cut. Like, okay. yeah. I know we've got some other presenters, but, but, but so far with all the conversation, it doesn't sound like a concrete. But may I toss out yet. something? Yes. Just, yeah. Just, just for the public interest. Um, there's... Tennis pickleball tournaments. There's a tournament at the YMCA that Johnny and I started, uh, which raises seven or eight thousand dollars a year. Um, it's limited to eight courts. Um, Johnny is running a tournament in two weeks in Concord, um, which will have 18 courts. It'll be able to facilitate another 50, 60 players it'll raise in excess of $10,000. If the pickleball, and he's not doing this for a profit. I mean, he's never run the, the cheer line tournament or Johnny's my brother, by the way, for the record, the pickleball tournament or the rotary tournament. He's never gotten paid a penny for any of that. He will, he's offered to run pickleball tournaments. In a couple of years, the profits from the pickleball tournaments would create a fund if Parks and Rec would allow the dollars that are earned at that tournament to go into a budget to fix the tennis courts. The delayed gratification, but the pickleball uh, profits could result in resurfacing the other four tennis courts. And, and that might be the best, the first and best use of those dollars. Just, just to let you know, there is this source of money by converting these courts. Well, <clears throat> I've been listening a lot. For 34 minutes, <laughs> which is, you know, everybody knows I'm right a whole lot, which led to a laundry list of more fact finding. No comments from anyone, and you can't tell by the way I look, but I don't play pickleball or tennis. Okay, so this is a fact finding mission for me. You guys are really good. I've got this 
great book of tons of facts. So I know we're talking to the experts that are going to lead us down the right path. So a few of my questions have been answered. As far as costs, what was the amount of funds that were being gifted specifically designated for resurfacing of only the pickleball courts? When was the last time these courts were resurfaced, all six? It was prior to me coming. I know it was re requested in 2014, 15, possibly 13, 14. I want to say, it, and at that point, it was near the five year, I want to say 2010, possibly. It should be done about every five to seven years. Okay. Unless somehow they get better, you know, better wear than, than on average. So literally, it's been 10 years. Yeah. Since any of them have been. Correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I know that tennis league play requires six courts. What is the number of courts for pickleball league play? Uh, it could be any number of courts you determine. I mean, it could be six courts, it could be four courts, it could be one court. And when we whatever's, speak of whatever's six, available. when we speak of six, that would be equivalent to two tennis courts. Yes. That's the map. So the two existing ones. Because we have two that exist today down there. Right. They're shared courts, correct? Yeah, the, the, the two, two existing are question, shared. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they could be used for league play. Is that correct? How about and, for tennis? Yes. No, no, no. I'm talking about oh, pickleball. All right. Those six. Yes, they could be used for league play. And then play. with those shared courts and the other existing four, we can have tennis league as well. Yes, we've correct? talked about trying to marry those two, those courts there. The, the, what we call convertible mm -hmm. courts. Um, and then some, it's been asked before about what about high school play. She, when she reserves for high school play, she reserves four courts for the high schools. Um, and someone would say, well, if you remove the two tennis courts and put in six pickleball courts, at least four. So if the high schools are playing, at least none for the public. That's not any different than what we have to do a whole gym. Right, it's or, reserved. I, I get yeah. that. I get so if, if anybody were to ask, like, yeah, we would reserve it for this high school to use it for that day or this college, then, you that know. That would hold true for, for any day. sport, yeah. right? You've reserved that location for that time frame. Okay. Um, so you could do it on six sports, which is equivalent to two. Okay. And just something else, um, Sam's been reaching out, and I don't want to put them out there, but the school system to try to look at how can we partner with them to a make all their courts accessible, um, whether it's a user agreement through the city to make their courts any of their usable courts accessible to citizens, their their tennis courts, and or is there any way that we, myself as a grant writer, um, an experienced grant writer, can get with the school system to say, hey, are you eligible for any grants? I can help you write. If you can then, maybe they can do a campaign to raise the matching funds to refurbish their courts to get more tennis courts in the city or in the community. Okay. Um, so I know in our needs assessment plan, we got a lot of great information. Um, some of it is a little confusing. We have listed in here the two clay tennis courts um, at Town Creek Park. Are those usable tennis courts? They are in disrepair. They are not. Okay. They That's the answer. Um, where can I go play tennis today? Tell me all the locations in the city that I can go play tennis today if I am not a member of somewhere. Public courts in the city of Salisbury. I mean, I mean, I get it. You might have to do the fee that the city thing, right? Because, Terry, you manage that, don't you? Okay. So, and I'm going to ask the same thing about pickleball. So if you can. Right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, we did a count of the county. I'll mm -hmm. just say that. So of okay. the county, and there I, were. I, I'm kind of tasked with taking care of the city. Okay. I understand. We do have county schools who do use our facilities. So that's why I was going to say county. But. Um, so the county schools use our. Yeah, we do have some county schools that use our facilities. Yeah. So. Um, throw in. North. Primarily Sorry, I can't see. I bought a, recently bought a pair of readers, so I apologize. <laughs> Good luck. Not have them. You On and off. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, Knox, Henderson. And this is where I can play tennis. Well, Henderson doesn't have any. Knox has three. Now these are in various conditions. 
It, just like ours. Just, just like ours. Do they belong to the city or they belong to the no, school she, system? Just the public use system. that you could just go. Just for public use only. Okay. Then Salisbury has six. Salisbury High School? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no. So, yeah. Obviously, obviously, City Park. City yeah, City Park. Park. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, where where can I go do the same thing with pickleball? Where can I access pickleball? The city zero. I can't play pickleball anywhere. I don't know. No permanent. There are no permanent there. pickleball courts. There are no permanent pickleball courts in the city limit. My question was, where can I go play pickleball today? All gym. All gym. There are there are temporary courts. You can play three times a week. Okay. The temporary. The current temporary courts at City Park. Can I play at City Park? Yes, on the temporary course. If you walk down there right hey, well, now, I just, take a net, it's the, you just the question. Yeah. Um, can I play at the Y? Yeah, you'd have you to pay a fee. Yeah. Okay. Do I have access to Knox and Salisbury High School? That's what we're trying That's to work. Yeah. That's what we're but we don't today. So today I couldn't go play there. Is that correct? Because I'm not a Knox or, or a Hornet. I'm not sure Is that correct? Mean. I mean, I'm not, asking. I'm not sure of a concrete answer for that question. That's what I'm trying to um, work on for us to see if there is right. a policy that the school system has on general public use. Which um, is fantastic. It seems, it's a great idea. It seems to vary from school okay. to school. So, so then all these places that you named for public places to go play tennis may not be accessible by the public because you're trying to find that out. From the That's what we're trying to find out. Okay, so then, yeah. Okay, so back to City Park, right? We have six tennis courts there. Let's pretend they're perfect. I don't know, right? They're usable tennis courts, right? Two of them are currently shared courts, which create six courts for pickleball, right? That's what we have today. We would like to get those all resurfaced and utilize for tennis and pickleball, right? The the and is what we're going for here, not the pickleball versus tennis. It's it's an and, right? So if we resurface um, the two pickleball courts with, with the gift from donors, why is that no longer allowed to be a tennis court? Because well, we today they're shared. So why does that go away is my question. They would become permanent pickleball courts with the sleeves in the ground. And that's something we've nets talked about. That's for the nets. Correct. And that's something we talked about with the board uh, and even the, the donors that, look, we want to make these removable. Mm -hmm. So then we could, we would have to, it's, it's gone the other way too. We could look at taping off lines for tennis, but there would be, then you'd have the same issue where it is today where there would be lines that cross with some of the tennis players don't like but that would be the option that but, we would have but they're still usable yeah for league play courts for both of them right yeah if they're not permanent that's it's in my in my head help me figure this out i've seen a gazillion emails and some facts i'm not i'm just trying to stick to the facts here okay um so We can, we can, we can use all six. I've, I've been hearing this for a year now. It is important. Our well-being is great. It makes us a great community. A healthy, active community makes us last forever, right? It makes Salisbury sustainable. All those good things. This is all good news. How do we get to it? Um, I, I think the, what I. It reeks because it was dedicated specifically for something. I'm just going to say it because we all felt it. Um, that doesn't make it a bad thing. But how things kind of went down with this were not great. Nothing to do with our parks and rec department. My concern is why do we have to do this or piece when clearly there's an and solution? Now, long term, obviously we have four other courts that we need to resurface. And we need to figure that out, right? That is incumbent on us 
to, frankly, I'm a little disturbed that we've missed out maybe on the fact that there's grants out there for part of the USTA program and we can match it and when things weren't maybe as tight as they are today, maybe we could have been moving along this path. But again, you're right, you got this laundry list of other things and if you got something to invest in, you got bigger ones that give more youth programs and things like that, I understand that. But I don't see why we can't have this and solution. What does the and solution mean? The and solution is that we resurface and not don't we make that a tennis and a pickleball court. I am not ever going to sacrifice one for the other in any scenario. Our whole job, my whole job here is to set policies for and and being as inclusive as possible. In this particular case, I am not willing to sacrifice one sport for another. I think that we need to land at an and point. I appreciate your all's work and your guidance. I will happily leave with whatever you all recommend and it, that is decided. But that is where I, I, I land, that I feel like there is an and solution now and then we look forward to finishing it. That's where I land. And then that's before I even hear the other folks, so I'm looking forward to that. Well, the last thing I'll say, I think, is that um, there were seven questions that I emailed over, and, and council saw my questions. And the two staff people that went to was you, Mr. Osebis, and Mr. Bailey. And I don't, did either of you ever respond to those questions? Uh, I, I thought it was for tonight. I've got some. Well, okay, so you've got the answers for me tonight. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So um, you asked who presented the information. Mm -hmm. um, it, and what was presented to, it was staff that presented the information to the advisory board when we talked about the brief. My understanding was you were asking about the, the November meeting revote. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So staff presented the information, um, and the uh, advisory board had already heard, I mean, they'd been a part of it the whole time. So they kind of already knew, knew everything, but we just kind of rehashed it just to make sure they all understood what we were putting out there. Okay. With the, Again, the main thing was our biggest recommendation was not to build a separate whole new facility okay. um and then i don't have your questions in front of me i just wrote the answers down um uh, staff and the advisory board used the master plan information um which had no mention of tennis uh, at the public info sessions mm -hmm. we did three public info sessions for um the uh, master plan one at which sam and i were on the phone with miss james and we explained to her to come to touch a truck uh, to bring bring the tennis group, we, that was the only group we said to exactly to come out, other than general advertising and sending out to everybody. We said, so, come out and give your opinion on tennis, um, you know. And then on the June fourth council meeting, was that for number three? I'm just sorry. Do you have a number by the answer? So I'll no, know. I'm sorry. I don't. I can pull it up on my phone. But yeah, because I want to make sure I'm getting the right answers to the questions you know, right. that I. Yeah. you want to read them out? Uh, well, well, I can. So my first question was, was what information was presented to the Parks and Rec Board before their final vote? I think you addressed that. Who were the presenters of that information? You addressed that. The third one was with specific indicators, how did the board arrive at their decision? Yeah. And so I thought you would kind of get yes. into some of that yeah, with number three. Okay, my fourth question is, was there any voting member on the Parks and Rec Board that had a financial vested interest? Yeah. Okay. Uh, number five, how was the decision best serving both tennis and pickleball communities? And I think we've kind of been here in conversation about that tonight, so I don't think we need to go back into that right now. Um, number five, I'm uh, sorry, number six, how does this decision impact at-risk youth and low-wealth communities who only have access to public courts? And so I know we're talking about the public courts at the public schools, but having been an employee in the public school system and knowing people who are in the public school system right now, they get a little tricky because there are liability issues when they allow people to come onto their facilities and use those facilities because they're not the city and they're not Parks and Rec. So, um, so, 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 so to me, those don't count as areas where we have access for public use. Uh, and number seven, what program does the city offer to the tennis and pickleball communities? And I think you addressed that earlier, you know, that we don't have anything right now. But aren't, well, you're working on getting that instructor who's going to be yes, able to do both. Is a, that correct? Yeah, we had I mean, someone who, the previous instructor, so we had programming, but the instructor left in December, and then we 
Terry met a second time with a particular instructor, um, and now is look, working out details because okay. it is contracted. So, so yeah, so and that'll Brian, be for both, right? This is an and. This is a possible and. Yeah, okay. this person. Okay. Yes, that's Which that's fair. And the way, and we also see just to, about the programming too. We feel like that if this went forward, we feel like this could foster growth in both. You could start out in pickleball and transition into tennis, and, and hopefully it'll foster interest in both sports. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, the only thing I didn't catch there was how did they come to their decision? Uh, we the advisory board. The advisory board. We presented uh, kind of what I went through earlier uh, at the beginning, and then they discussed it, all the pros and cons. And the biggest thing they kept going back to was budget constraints, um, uh, facility needs. Uh, and the master plan about what what was mentioned in the master plan. Multi-use facility. They brought that up too, but um, not that we mentioned that. But um, so yeah, so they they use those uh, kind of as their basis and discuss it, and they uh, put it for a vote and voted. And we've been hearing about it for a year. Yeah, I would ask the council's pleasure that we let the two groups give their positions on this and I would also ask the council's pleasure I'm going to step away and use the restroom we can either do a rest recess or you can keep moving doesn't matter I'll be Let's right back have a five minute recess Thank and, you. Uh,
that break. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to move to where uh, we have the tennis group that will make a presentation with their facts, um, and you will have 15 minutes. Uh, so when you begin, uh, the clock will start to uh, count down. And Madam Mayor, while they are coming forward, can, can we sort of address the elephant in the room very quickly and allow the city attorney to talk about, um, uh, you know, Mayor, uh, Councilman Post being able to vote on the decision? Because I know there's been so many questions about the investment of the money. Um, and, and so I think people need to understand. Can we know. also address the fact that these people gave her money for her campaign? Can we what? address both of them at the same time? That who gave me money for my campaign? They, they supported your campaign? Well, they probably supported your campaign too, David. Well, but but we're not <laughs> campaigning here. There's just been a question about it. And I, I think if we all sit back and listen, we'll all understand and be all right. Yeah. I'll just say that there's not a conflict right. on this council to vote. I mean, Mr. Post does not have a conflict to vote in this matter. It's a legislative matter. Um, council members have a duty to vote. They are only permitted to be um, excused from voting in limited circumstances and for legislative decisions, which this is one, um, it's only if they have a financial interest in the outcome. A donation for a project is not a financial interest in the outcome. Um, as far as the other things, they don't relate to legislative decisions. If we're in a quasi-judicial setting, you've got to consider bias and, and making up your minds beforehand. None of that comes into play. Here, the only question is whether there's a financial interest in the outcome, and in this case, there's not, so there's no conflict of interest in any council member, including Mr. Post, voting on this. Thank you for that, Mr. Courier. And, and just for the record, I had already had the discussion with the city attorney uh, about this because it has been a huge question. People have been wondering. And uh, we, we don't want anyone in the public to think that there's a council member who's trying to do something that is um, uh, not above board. It, our, the public trust is important, and so I thought it was important for people to understand that you have not broken the public trust. I don't think that was the reason for the question. That was the reason for the question. That. that was absolutely the reason for the question, but that's okay. You are where you are, and that's fine. So thank you all for being here to present tonight. <laughs> so, Mary, you're up. Thank you. Um, well, I am just, um, I am just really appalled and bummed at sort of a lot of whatever. It does seem to me that several of you have just made up your mind. Sometimes I think, what am I doing here, even bothering? But um, I do have some thoughts, and I will share them. Um, I know that you all must be weary of this whole topic. It's been battered around for over a year. But the tennis community, at least, is enormously grateful that you have allowed this additional deliberation before you render a decision. I know that some feel um, that the Parks and Rec Advisory Board vote should be the final word. Um, but I really think you all as council members and the overseers of our purse strings should have the final word and we're, you know, we're grateful for that. I hope in the meantime, over all these months, that all of you have taken the time to go down to City Park <clears throat> and to see those courts um, and to see the pickleball lined courts and to go to Dan Nicholas Park and see those courts that are brand new dedicated pickleball courts with no tennis lines, just so you have an idea of what courts look like um, and, and what we're talking about, because I think you all indicated, except for one, that you don't, you don't play either sport. Um, I also just want to say at the beginning, we don't mean to denigrate Parks and Rec or destroy staff um, or advisory board morale um, in light of the work they've put into this, but we have only ever wanted to offer a perspective that we think was overlooked. Um, as this whole process was going on. Um, and I think that's what civil government is all about. You know, you look at controversy over rezoning for a dollar store or closing schools. So I think we had a right to sort of bring up our perspective. Um, I honestly don't look as kindly, Mayor, on a private donation as you do, um, or perhaps others of you. I think private money is terrific. And I have said this before, when it goes for something like Hurley Park, or the dog park, or some the, the Vietnam Memorial that we had. But when private money swoops in to a public taxpayer-funded facility, that the optics are different there. And, and I'm going to be real 
upfront about it. It swoops in, it fixes up six beautiful new pickleball courts, and I'm going to put it right out there. You look on there, they're all white, retired, lovely people. And you're going to leave the rest of those courts in horrible shape for the rest of the city to play, including the schools and kids and minority kids. The optics of that is outrageous. And I think you should never consider accepting private money to do something like that unless you have committed to resurface all those courts for everybody. That's number one. I want to just summarize sort of where we stand. The tennis community has always admitted that city court usage has declined unquestionably. And you have um, made the point before, the reasons are two. One, the deterioration of the courts that has driven players away. And two, we have never had really in a many, many years a viable tennis program. To say that we had a viable tennis program with Bobby Christman, who was recently there, is not correct. He gave private lessons, period, end of story. We had no other. He did one camp in the summer. That's not a tennis program. Okay. So I came here thinking that at least one of those issues had been addressed, namely the resurfacing. I, I mean, I, I was confident that at least you would see the wisdom in resurfacing these courts. Um, and I, I just reiterate that that is something um, you've got to do for all six courts. The second component is a viable tennis program. And there is a gentleman referred to who is well known in the community, a professional who has excellent credentials, um, uh, well known, as I say, in the community, who has offered his services to Parks and Rec to be a tennis coach. And that, as was mentioned, with no compensation, he would generate his revenue um, from the programs. We considered that a game changer. It wasn't just a theoretical thing like, gee, we're going to really get tennis back on track. This was a real human being who has applied for the coaching job. Don't know if he's going to be hired, but let me just tell you what his vision is so you get an idea of what a real tennis program could be. His ideas are to have individual and group lessons, beginning lessons for kids, junior play days, something called tennis in a weekend for adults who are learning the game um, or maybe are trying to get back into it after they used to play years ago in college. Um, a tennis academy for kids who are aiming to join a school team or achieve a state ranking. Summer camps. A minority outreach program, which is critical. Um, prime candidates, of course, would be minority kids who can't afford to play, you know, in, in Country Club or Catawba where you need to play. Um, maybe you don't know this, but a prominent local foundation has already expressed keen interest in supplying a multi-thousand dollar grant for a minority outreach program. And also, Catawba's assistant coach, Clincy Trammell, has already agreed um, to help with that minority program. Um, tournaments are also planned. USTA, as well as um, tournaments for local kids and adults. Seniors, something called Universal Tennis Rating Tournament, UTR for teens. Um, this is all in addition to people like us and several men's groups and ladies, you know, who come and just play independently. So all of this, um, especially the tournaments, and not just the Rotary Tournament that was dispersed over several venues, but these tournaments that would be run as a real tennis program by Parks and Rec, need to be at a single location, and, and you need six courts for that, not four. Sure, I guess you could cram them into four courts, but limiting courts limits programs. And so that's why Salisbury High School and Catawba and um, the Country Club have six courts, because that's sort of the standard number that you need for a robust tennis program. I do, I've done a lot of research, and there are other towns have been converting tennis to pickleball courts, and they've been adding pickleball lines to tennis courts, but never by reducing the dedicated number of, pickle, of, of tennis courts below six. And I have personally checked Hickory, Reedsville, Moxville, Lexington, 
Les Myers in Concord, Statesville, Huntersville, Greensboro. They all have more than six dedicated tennis courts, and so they had the luxury of being able to convert others, you know, to pickleball, either dedicated pickleball or just adding pickleball lines. All of them I talked to were appalled that we would even consider cannibalizing our six-court complex. And your question, it's an easy answer. How many tennis courts do we have in the city? Six. City Park. That's it. The high school, those aren't public courts. They're locked all the time. So is Knox. So, I mean, that's a simple answer. We used to have those, too, if you remember at Civic uh, Park, those clay courts. But they're gone. Two of them are a dog park, and the other two have weeds growing on them, and there aren't even any nets. So City Park is it. Seven minutes. Um, Keep now, I just want to mention schools for a minute. Parks and Rec often, and I, I've heard them say that they sort of suggest, well, we're not really, you know, we don't have to cater to the needs of private institutions like Salisbury Academy or Sacred Heart because they don't have courts, um, or Livingstone College because their four courts are in disrepair, or public schools like Knox because their three courts are in disrepair, or North Rowan because, gee, they're in the county, they're not in the city. You know, I would argue that all students, gosh, no matter where they live or go to school, should have the right to make full use of the only dedicated six-court tennis facility we have in this whole county. I think we should be welcoming them. We should be encouraging them. Our schools have some amazing um, players. Now, it's also been said um, that those schools that use the city park only use four courts. This is true. But you know why? It's because Parks and Rec, and perhaps you heard that, has a rule that no one can book more than four courts. So you're stuck. So, because they want to leave two courts, you know, for walk-ins. But the point is, schools use more. They use six courts, and what they do is they have to stagger their matches because they're stuck with four courts. So they got to wait for somebody to finish playing, and then the next, and they end up playing until it gets dark. Um, so the bottom line, um, frankly, I think schools ought to be using all six courts. Let them. I mean, if I wanted to go down and play, and I saw a school using all six courts. I'd say, great, I'd sit down and watch them. Um, so the bottom line is, schools have indicated to me that they would go back and use the city park courts if they had good, decent courts. And, by the way, no pickleball noise. Let me just tell you, I got an email from, Gwen is here. Gwen, where are you? Livingstone College coach. You want to stand up? They, um, uh, Livingstone used to use Salisbury High School because the city park courts were in such terrible shape. Gwen finally decided that it's not fair to keep using Salisbury High School because pretty soon their courts are going to start deteriorating if they let other people use them. So they committed to using city park courts again this upcoming season. They have booked the courts, and she said, however, I am asking Parks and Rec to please make sure there's no pickleball played while we have matches. So I just want you to know that the noise from pickleball is a, you know, is a serious issue. Now, if two courts, and it was mentioned before, if because there is this talk about using all those courts for 18 pickleball um, courts for a tournament, what you do is you tape off lines and you use all the rest of them. That wouldn't be all the time, you know, two, three tournaments a year, I guess. The point is, that is 72 people on those courts. Did you hear? How loud that is? Okay, there's a neighbor here. Isn't there a neighbor who lives on Miller Street? I think she left. Oh, she left. But I think she, she was here. You. She was here. She said, are you kidding? It's already bad enough. Can you imagine that? I think um, that's what happens if you start out with a few pickleball courts. They're going to take over the whole thing, and there goes tennis. And I think that would limit tennis availability. It would be a nightmare for parking, and the noise would be a disaster. Now, um, how many women? Three, like three, three and a half. half. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I think we want a pickleball facility. I think we should have one. I agree totally. It would be a fabulous asset um, in our city. But it just you, it's not viable to cram all this in a six-court complex. I'm telling you, you've got to have a separate facility for pickleball. <laughs> Um, and we want that. And I think Brian Wine sort of alluded to the fact we have got to be creative and think outside the box about how to do this. 
Other communities have done it. I talked to Reedsville. They had a huge parking lot, and they'd repave that and put benches down and lights. I mean, there, there's already been talk, by the way, of um, partnering maybe with the Y or with Trinity Oaks. Um, there is someone there who was interested in partnering with Parks and Rec about maybe, um, you know, anyway, partnering situation. Rufty Homes, the town of Spencer, I've heard talk that maybe they'd like to do something. So. Um, you know, there are possibilities that I think we need to think about, because I know it costs money. I get that. Um, we could save money over several years. We could continue to add money to the $25,000 donation. We could build incrementally. You don't have to have a Cadillac pickleball facility. Have a couple courts. Add some later. Add lights later. Um, but about a bond issue. Parks and Rec talks about all of these needs that have not been met. Maybe we do a bond issue to build a pickleball facility and, and um, needs, and, and the other needs. Anyway, I'm going to run out of time. I think the bottom line for us is because I thought and I would hope there could be money to resurface those courts. I would like to see them dedicated to tennis. I would like Parks and Rec, rec um, to bring someone on board who's interested in jump-starting a tennis program, and I would so like to plead with you that you give tennis 12 months to see what we can do to jumpstart tennis and make this a thriving tennis community again, which it used to be. Um, I think if you limit it to four courts, you, you, know, you destroy the idea of having a robust um, tennis program here. I feel like converting them will pull the rug out from under us when we have this chance to see what we can do um, with tennis again. And I feel like failing to invest in tennis over all these years and allowing the court usage to, allowing the court usage to decline, well, that's great. And then you come back and say, okay, you know, now we're gonna take a 30 year courts away. I'm like, that's like another kick in the stomach, you know? Um, and I think converting those courts is certainly the easiest, cheapest, most expedient way to accommodate um, the pickleball community, but it is not the right way to go about it. And I think we really, you know, it seems to be easy, but it is a big decision. It's a big deal, and it has repercussions all the way around. Um, I think there's even a social justice component here. Do we want to cater, with all due respect, to an older, retired community before we have really exhausted our efforts to invest in our own youth community, um, and particularly our minority population. Um, but here's what I'd really like to offer as a compromise. I would love for you all to give us 30, uh, one, let me just say, one, um, year. shut up, um, one year to see what we can do, and I would be willing to say if tennis is as dead as pickleball thinks it is, take those courts and convert them, okay? I'd be willing to say that, but I would be desperate to have you um, give us a chance. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Mr. Post, you're up. Jason's got a uh, Jason. Oh, he's got a presentation. He's got a PowerPoint, and I okay. just want to make sure he gets that uh, All right. loaded before I sit That's down right. and start my timer. Okay, thank you. Did you bring us charts and graphs? Yes, <laughs> lots of numbers. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, awesome. Um, thank you. Hi, Council. Hi, folks. Um, Mayor. Uh, oh my gosh, you know, I know y'all have had enough of this, and I certainly have, and uh, all the arguments we heard tonight, everything we heard from Nick and Terry and Sam and Mary and everybody else that spoke tonight, we've all heard them before, and I promise not to make you guys listen to me say all, say the arguments for the pickleball courts, again, things I know you've heard a million times. So mine's not going to be as long. Um, I would like to respond to a few things I've heard tonight. Uh, first of all, as Graham said, I have no financial interest, as Tamara pointed out, no financial interest in the tennis courts. I made a donate. I mean, in the pickleball courts, I made a donation. But I did not, I don't have, there's no gain there for me. 
I do everything for free that I do in the pickleball community. I've offered, I told Nick that I would run these tournaments for free, that I would teach lessons to beginners for free, that I would run leagues, that I would run clinics. I would do that for free. Hopefully, uh, if we hire the person that y'all are talking about that knows tennis and pickleball and is getting his pickleball certification, he would take off some of that load, but I have made that offer that I would do that for free. That is certainly not, uh, I'm not I don't have any financial interest built into all of that stuff. I spent some time today um, looking, first of all, I have to write out everything I say because I'm terrible at doing this. So, you know, I'm pointing out that most of the stuff that's been said tonight I've scratched off because it's already been said. So, but um, I, I was concerned about the USTA and their guidelines for minimum number of courts for various tennis activities, leagues, tournaments, school matches. And I called them today. Now, everybody, other people might have too. I looked on their website. I couldn't find anything about minimum number of courts on their website. I'm not saying it's not there. There's a trillion pages on the internet, and I might have missed the uh, correct page. Sweetie, would you bring me my water, please? And and but I checked their website, and I couldn't find it. I called them and I asked them about it. They said they do not know of any guidelines about minimum court, min minimum number of courts for USTA matches or league play. I played in a bunch of leagues, uh, tennis leagues. Um, I called. Um, they told me to call the Southern Tennis Association. Maybe they would have it. That's USTA is on top. Southern is about eight states. I called them, asked them the same question. They had no guidelines that they could tell me about. I, that, but they suggested I call the North Carolina Tennis Association. So I called the North Carolina Tennis Association, and I asked them, are there any guidelines for minimum number of courts? They said, not that they know of, but maybe for school matches, I should call the North Carolina High School Activities Association. I called them, and they were too busy, and since I didn't know I was going to be presenting today until last night, they never called me back before this meeting today, so I don't know what they said, but I did scour the rules for the high school, North Carolina High School Tennis Association, and the only thing I could find was the Georgia High School, Tennis Asso high school Sports Association. They require two courts for their state tournament. All other team matches and everything else, they have no minimum court requirements. They did, the Georgia tennis, tennis program had it. I could not find anything about it on North Carolina's high school tennis league stuff. So anyway, anyway, uh, we would be very lucky to have uh, the person, uh, nobody's saying his name, but to have the guy that uh, is you know, possibly coming to work here. I've known him for a long time. He's a great guy. He's a great uh, tennis teacher. He's going after his certification, and um, he would be really good for the city because he knows both both sports. Um, cities all over the North Carolina, North Carolina, and the United States are converting uh, portions of their public tennis courts into pickleball. I'm going to show you pictures in a couple of minutes of at least ten facilities that had six tennis courts that converted two of those tennis courts into pickleball courts. I'm going to show you pictures of 10 in just a minute, contrary. So, um, uh, you know, listen, I, this has been said a million times, but I go by the park all the time. You know, if there were four tennis courts left, there would be plenty of room for recreational play. Yes, tournaments, you know, there would have to be something done with tournaments, and I'm going to talk about that in my PowerPoint. But um, uh, I've never seen more than two or three courts being used in rec play, and I'm there all the time. And I've never seen any of the people that have come up here to talk. And all the time that I'm there playing tennis, pickleball, I never see any of the people that have come up here to talk playing while I'm there. That could just be, but I'm there a lot. Um, I would like to say this. The playground at the city park used to have sliding boards, seesaws, and merry-go-rounds. There was even a jet plane for kids to climb on and a little train on the other side of the creek. Some of you may remember that. Now the <coughs> playground is completely different. It has a tire swing. It has climbing bars. It has swings. The city recreation department continues to modify their offerings to accommodate as many people as possible. Times change. The city council is looking at changes to the city's transportation program. 
We're going to have a separate mayor's election in two years. The planning board, which I'm also, which I volunteer for, is rewriting the LDO to promote economic development. We're changing setback guidelines. Rules regarding sidewalks and tree canopies are being scrutinized to make it easier and more attractive for people and businesses to move to Salisbury. Things change. Times change. We need to listen to the trends. As a member of the Parks and Rec Advisory Board, <coughs> the most important goal I've learned as I sit on that board is that these guys are trying to do it, a lot of work with a little bit of money. And that is constantly what they are working towards. And, uh, <coughs> and they're trying to provide as many services as possible given the limited resources to the department. And I believe that this court conversion fits into those overall citywide goals. Um, real quickly, uh, and then I'm going to show a slide, my, my slides. Oh, uh, you know, has anybody ever watched Maria Sharapova play tennis? Ah, ah, talk about sound and tennis players grunt. Pickleball players don't grunt. I know that, I know that, uh, the, 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 the ball is, is louder in pickleball, but there's a tennis, tennis is a grunting sport. And, uh. And this conversion is not about tournaments. It's just not. It's not about the traffic for tournaments. It's not about really the uh, play of 72 people or whatever for tournaments. It's not about, um, it's not about, uh, uh, it's just not about tournaments. It's about recreational play for the, for the community. I'm going to show you this really quick because I don't want to take too much more time than I wanted. This, this article right here, uh, it's by NBC News, and they said, Pickleball has had a 650% increase in numbers over the last six years, according to the USAPA. The biggest subset of that growth is not with the over 60 crowd, says Justin Maloof, executive director of the USAPA, but the younger set. And in this article that uh, Liz wrote, I just want to point out about these 17 temporary, six dedicated 17 temporary pickleball courts. It was not incorrect, but to be clear, the six permanent pickleball courts are at Dan Nicholas, which he said, but pointing that out. Nine of those 17 are at the, at the YMCA, and they only use three at a time. They don't ever have nine set up. That's so that they can shift around their play. They might have basketball in the big gym and pickleball in the little gym, but that's nine, but it's really just a three-court facility, except during a tournament. They never have nine for pickleball. Three courts at Hall Gym are only available during uh, three hours a day, three hours, three times a week. Six courts at the city park require players to bring their own nets. So, to be clear, there is not one single place in the city of Salisbury that you can play pickleball in the evenings or on the weekends if you don't have a net and if you're not a member of the Y. So you either have to own a net and be able to carry it, or you need to be a member of the Y, or, uh, or you can't play. This is a tournament in 1976 that I ran when I was the pro for the city. Uh, I was the pro for the city for two years, but uh, tennis pro. But we had 33 players in the men's championship bracket, 42 players in the men's A bracket. That's 75 players. 100% of them were from Rowan County. We had six courts at the city park at the time and three at Knox that we used. We had nine courts. This is the draw from the last Rotary tournament. We had nine players. Two of them, the two circled, are from Rowan County. And at the time that we had this, all of these places offered their courts to us. The city park, we had four, not counting the two at the pickleball lines. We had Catawba College let us use six. Salisbury High said we could use six. The Country Club said we could use six. And Knox said we could use three. There were 25 courts available to us for the tournament. And we didn't need them because that's never been the limiting factor. So for future tournaments, we have more than enough courts. Okay. This is some of the communities in North Carolina. This is Andrews Recreation Park in Andrews. New pickleball courts. This, you can see in the lower right, you can see a top-down view. That was two tennis courts they converted. One of the tennis courts over to four pickleball courts. This one, this one, you don't see it, but Apex Nature Park had six tennis courts. They used one of them to make these four pickleball courts, but I didn't know that was going to be an issue, so I cut it off to, so we could zoom in there. But that's one of six. This is Ting Park and Holly Springs. They had six courts also, and I just they were up above, and I cut it off because I didn't know that, that was going to be an issue, but they converted one of their tennis courts into four pickleball courts. This is a place called White Oak Park and Cary, three courts. This is uh, Troy, North Carolina, six new courts. This is Armstrong Park and uh, High Point. They converted two tennis courts to 
four pickleball courts. This is Ephesus Park in Chapel Hill, six courts. They converted two of them to six pickleball courts. You can see the pickleball courts here on the lower left, but this was a six-court facility that lost two of the courts to pickleball. And the pickleball courts, I might add, are packed. They have 200 people in their program. If you go there 9 o'clock in the morning, noon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 6 p.m., you will have to wait 30 minutes between 20-minute games to play. They are packed constantly 100% of the time. The people in Chapel Hill are getting a lot of exercise. Um, this is Carpenter Park in Cary. This is uh, uh, Stanback Park in Mount Gilead. They have four pickleball courts. I won't spend a lot of time on it. This is, uh, I can't say the name of it, but it's in Murphy, North Carolina. They converted one of their four courts to pickleball courts. This town converted one pickleball court into four. Greensboro Parks and Rec just added five pickleball courts. This was this summer. Uh, this is Clay County Rec Center. This is John Stevens in Charlotte. You can see the layout on the left, and it's a beautiful new facility in Charlotte. This is at Holden Beach. Um, they, uh, that's a news story. That's just a picture of one court, but they have four courts. Riverside Park in Mount Airy. This is another place where they converted two of their six tennis courts in Middleton Park. Uh, to, to sit. Two of the courts got switched over to six pickleball courts, just like that's exact the exact program we're hoping for. Uh, this is Method Road Park in Raleigh, six new. This is uh, uh, Flaherty Park uh, in Wake Forest. They had two tennis courts. They converted them to four pickleball courts. This uh, Cub Creek Park, they had two. They added two. And this is Bessemer City. Um, they added one pickleball court. The city just built them one because the people wanted a pickleball court. Um, I think there's every reason to believe that tennis and pickleball can work together to provide both activities for the citizens of Salisbury. And I've spoken longer than I want, but I do want to show you this one last thing. Um, this is on a Wednesday, June, April 20th, 2019, Salisbury City Park. Uh, there may be audio, there may not be. I don't know what's going to happen here with the audio, but I was talking over the film while I was taping this. But, but watch, just please watch this video. All six pickleball courts are being used down here at the city park. Dang it. The far court, there's a tennis lesson being taught, but nobody's played recreationally here the whole time we've been here. Look at this. Six courts in use. Okay, that's it. Everybody brought their own nets, you know, which was not great, but there were people waiting. There were six courts being used, and I was there for uh, a long time, and that day and other days, and... I don't see tennis being played that much. There's plenty of tennis courts for recreational tennis. And uh, as we know, there are solutions to the <coughs> school, pro school match problems. <coughs> and uh, I think we can make it work together. <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a tennis player. I played tennis a couple of times this year, and I like to play tennis. Uh, plan to play, continue to play tennis in my life, and I would love to uh, have new resurfaced tennis courts. I uh, would hope that somehow, some way, either through private donations from the tennis community or from the city or a grant or however we can do it, I would love to see those courts resurfaced. I love tennis. I want to see tennis thrive. I think it's waning, but I would love to see it thrive. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. I really appreciate it. John. John, for the record, I knew you'd take 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, you were uh, 15 seconds less than 15 minutes. That's good. Okay. But, um, so what I'd like to do at this point is to call uh, Nick and his team back up <coughs> so that council can ask any questions that they need to ask um, before we move on. Okay, council, your team is back up. What questions do you have after each of the presentations? <clears throat> uh, 
questions or comments? Does it make any sense to have a bond facility to build a pickleball, a bond, issue a bond to build a pickleball facility? I, I don't believe so. I think that money could be used elsewhere. Build a new pool, multi-use center, improve hall gym, um, improve city park rec center, build bathrooms. <coughs> um. And we'll take anything new. We love new stuff. <laughs> the thing is, is we do, you know, public works does our maintenance. And, you know, I, I stress him enough with the assistance that they give us. And they give us awesome assistance, as I brought up last week. Um, you know, I have to keep them in mind when we're looking at new facilities and changing facilities. And if we keep building new and not repairing old, all of it's going to, at some point, going to be in disrepair, unfortunately. I think the dollars aren't going to keep up with the needs of, of the facility. Just Have you ever run a tennis or a pickleball tournament? I have never run neither. you know how many courts might be needed for either to, to run a, a viable tennis tournament or a viable pickleball tournament? No, oh, I mean, we've done other kind of tournaments. We've done baseball tournaments. You um, just typically take the amount of facilities that you have and you you schedule your tournament around your facility. Correct. We've never ran a sport. I worked as an athletic director before I um, came to Salisbury and the facil the number of courts wouldn't dictate um, the scheduling of the facility. You, you use what you have and you make it work yeah. in, in the recreation field. We, we've both been in the athletic director position at some point in our career and Sam's correct. You would take because if that were the case, there'd be a lot of cities that wouldn't even attempt to run any kind of tournament. You would, you look at what you have to offer, um, and and you you make it work. Maybe the schedule is longer. Maybe the day doesn't end at six; it ends at eight. Um, but if it brings revenue and tourism, you make it work. So I'm going to throw out there a couple of things, and we we'll yield the floor to others. A couple of things that I uh, wrote down from the notes uh, from the tennis group. Um, Resurfacing courts for everyone is fairness is fairness to all. I don't disagree with that. The condition of courts is deteriorating. That's been testified to several times, so I will accept that as a uh, true statement. We need a viable tennis program. I, I accept that as a true statement. I think if we have a good facility and we have good programming around that facility, we'll get the use we're looking for. So that's that's good. Limiting courts, limiting limits programs. I think that's true, but it's also true for pickleball. You limit the availability of space for that. You also limit the program that you could have for that. So I think I think that's that's true no matter what you, which side you're on. Um, the idea that we should just build a separate facility. Those of you that were paying attention to our goal setting retreat last couple of days or last week, whatever it was, um, we're we're in a condition where we don't have that luxury right now. We're we're facing some significant pressures on our budget next year that will cause us to have to go into fund balance. We don't have the resources to go out and build a new $300,000 pickleball facility. We just don't. Doesn't matter if it's something you like to hear or not, we don't. Um, I won't even comment on the social justice issue. Uh, the idea that we would take old white people and put them over here and keep uh, that, that there's, there's so much about that comment that it just, I'm just gonna leave it out there. Um, the, the point I would make is this. We serve the entire community, not just one part of it. Um, we have interest in both programs. Um, if this interest in trying to keep both programs going is enough to that we can fill that place up and nobody can have, get there without having to wait, it's a good problem to have. Um, I personally think that if you, we're going to have to resurface those courts regardless. And if I remember the math you gave us a minute ago, it's somewhere between sixty to $75,000 to do it. We can either pay for all of it ourselves and keep the programs that we've got, or we can leverage donations from our community and grants from other places and end up spending a third of that and have a facility that serves more people. I don't see where that, that's an and. To your point earlier, that's an and. We can spend less money and serve more people. Um, I don't see where this is a downside. Um, 
I personally am in favor, and I won't belabor this anymore because I can't get the last hour back in my life. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm personally in favor of moving forward with the, the planning board or the uh, Parks and Rec board's recommendation of, of moving forward with this. Furthermore, Mr. Bailey, um, I believe our facilities need to be taken care of, and I think if we can find the grant matching funds where we're putting a third into the bucket and, every, and we're getting grant funding for the rest, and the donation from the public uh, private source that we talked about, I'd be in favor of making that happen because it does give us a situation where both programs have a chance to be better after our, our efforts as opposed to one side getting special treatment and the other one not. So to me, that's where I think we need to go. I think we need to convert these two courts to pickleball. I think we need to resurface the whole facility. Hopefully it only comes out of pocket about $20,000 and we can actually have something that's better for our community. That's where I think we need to end up. And I'll yield the floor. Any other council like to weigh in? Well, I just don't want to sacrifice either group. And so if we can resurface those six courts, as well as provide the pickleball courts, um, and that there's a situation where pickleball and tennis are sharing, and I know that sometimes you don't want to share, but it still leaves the six courts. That's where I would like to see us go. I agree with uh, Brian on the math, um, and I think everybody's appreciative of that from the donors. Um, I just I have the biggest heartburn in the fact that it's stipulative that they're permanent courts. To me, the and is kind of there, but to to say that it's not fully there. And then you could have more pickleball courts even, right? And we got a chance to resurface them all. Couldn't you convert more of those to be shared ones as well? So it gives us even more of both. I, you know, um, <coughs> I think that's where I, I get tripped up on this, no matter. Both sides have a fantastic reason for playing both sports. Uh, you guys have done a great job. And, um, doing research, finding out what's going on, paying attention to trends. Um, but um, again, I'm, I'm not. I don't feel like I don't feel like it's right for me, and where I have to live in my space, that I should sacrifice something for something else. Um, if I could see that that's what's ha not happening, but the fact that it's stipulative, that it has to be a full time conversion. Um, for me, that's not a full and. Uh, but I will completely leave at peace in doing what the council and, and the board advises, however we follow on that. Okay. I have a comment if we're in a comment period. Yes. I, I want to, just a couple of comments. Uh, I want to address um, uh, the Mayor Pro Tem's question about at-risk youth and low-wealth communities. Um, uh, this is actually good for that. Tennis is a terribly expensive sport. Um, equipment's expensive. The only way to get any good is you have to have professional training for years. Um, I probably invested, I don't know, 15,000 bucks in two of my kids, you know, which isn't very much. And uh, they're fair. You know, they're not great. They're fair tennis players after a $15,000, you know, five, six year investment. Um, there are, and I was a high school tennis coach for six years, and I had two of my players that got college scholarships to Division I schools, and I played at a D1 school, and Johnny played at a D1 school, incidentally. Um, his parents spent more on his tennis training than they did, than it would have cost them to pay for him to go to college. And of course, in college, he quit tennis because he was sick of it. Um, and in contrast, pickleball is very, very inexpensive, and a lot of public courts, uh, well, first of all, well, a lot of public courts um, have little boxes, you know, that have paddles and balls locked in them because a paddle and a ball cost, you know, you can get them for $25. And kids love it out there. All those people you saw in that video, uh, most of those folks have been at the court at one time or another when some kids just walked in and said, can I hit a ball? And if there's an open court, hit a ball with them. The YMCA, I mean, I'm looking at my friends here who all play at the YMCA and Neil's head's going up and down. I mean, at the YMCA, 
you know, there'll be a kid just sitting there in the YMCA's. A lot of basketball players you get. We get three courts there, and then that leaves, you know, two, four, six, you know, basketball goals sitting there. And those kids will come over and watch us play pickleball. And the kids say, can I hit a ball? And we'll say, yeah. And the thing about pickleball is, and I encourage all of you to go out there, and I'll give you a lesson. Johnny will give you a lesson. Uh, this uh, pro that we have will give you a lesson. You know, in a few hours, you can be proficient and have fun at it. In tennis, there is no way in a few hours that you can be good at it. It is really hard. I mean, I watch kids come out to the park and play, and one kid hits the ball way over here, another kid's way over there, and after three minutes, they say, ah, oh, let's pick the ball up and go home. And that literally happens. You can see that going on out there. So pickleball, in fact, and, and there's a statewide effort right now underway uh, being led by a guy, I think he's from Concord, uh, to bring pickleball to kids. And to, and to provide it in the schools, in the elementary schools. And um, so pickleball, in fact, uh, is one of these things which will help and not harm uh, the, the low-income communities and the at-risk youth. I mean, it's something they can play and pick up and enjoy. Um, they'll enjoy tennis, but they do need training. I mean, a large amount of training in tennis. And this professional that we're looking at. I mean, I too have known him a few decades. Um, he's becoming a certified teaching pickleball pro. This guy's fabulous. And all that laundry list of things that he could do, you know, for tennis, which he has done for tennis, he'll do for pickleball too. I mean, he will reach out to kids. He will offer free clinics. I mean, the way our program works here is because, since we don't have any money in this budget to for a staff person to be a tennis pro, neither does the country club, I might add. Uh, what they do is, um, in a lot of communities, work like this. He's been a teaching pro in Charlotte, same thing, you know, where a percentage of his revenues from his fees, his teaching lesson fees, goes back to the sponsor, whether it was the club in Charlotte or whether it might be the city of Salisbury. Um, that's a discouragement from that pro helping kids because he's not getting paid for that. And this guy will do that. He's always done that. He's taken time out to help, you know, young young kids, and he provides equipment. And I'm looking there at about 10 pickleball players. There's not a single one of them, not a one of them, that wouldn't walk up right now and give you a paddle and say, put this in the bank. And look at the heads going up and down. Put this in the bank and use this for a kid's program. There's not a one out there that wouldn't do it. We could collect 25 or 50 paddles in two days you know, for a kid's program if, you know, if we wanted to. That can be done. So this is good for the community. It's not bad for the community, and I'm not going to address the comments directed at me. I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to make the donation. Uh, Janie Allen died last week. Um, she was the starter of the mural. Um, I was the one that said that we got to get the mural away from this defunct nonprofit and put it in public arts here in Salisbury. I've given money for that, given money for the mural before. I'm allowed to look at it, I guess. I didn't expect anything in return for it. I don't expect, I, I made a donation. They, they asked for, uh, you know, honorariums for her passing to either go to her church or to the city of Salisbury for the mural maintenance. And so that's what I did in honor of her. And um, I mean, I like the fact that I have the ability to provide some support, you know, to some organizations. And the way this came about, we didn't, I didn't swoop in. I just do want to address that. Um, we were painting lines at first. I mean, chalk on these courts. And then a couple of years ago, uh, Johnny and I met with Nick and said, what would it cost to do this? And there was all this investigation. And Nick, of course, said, and I was on city council, said, there's no money for this. And um, and so I said, well, what if we raise the money? You know, could we do it? And that's how it came about. It was our offer. We didn't come swooping in. It was just the lack of resources. And most of our conversations were with Stephen Brown, weren't with you, but uh, Nick was here part of the time. But it was something that pickleball players, um, uh, you know, thought that would be good for the city. We didn't see it as anything nefarious. We thought it as, as a plus. And I still think it's a plus. It's not intended to hurt anybody. I'm a tennis player, too. I've won tournaments. I've played in a bunch of tennis tournaments. I've played in leagues for 15 years, USTA leagues. 
you know, got to the finals of the state tournament in Virginia twice, once as a regular guy and once as an old guy. I'm one of these, you know, you know, white old people that was referred to, but, um, but you know, I, I played a lot of tennis and, and, um, and I lost my hips playing tennis. I had to have both my hips replaced when I was 50 years old. And I haven't been able to play tennis since because you can't run as well. But I can play pickleball. It's like somebody found me a new life, another ball I can chase. I'm a dog. I need a ball to chase. And, uh, you know, and this is good for the community. I never intended it to be swooping in, to uh, be something bad. I thought it was something good. And so I just want everybody to know that I never, this was never intended to take anything away from anyone. Thank you, David. Um, so um, I serve as the Parks and Rec um, liaison from council. And of course, I have no vote, uh, and I don't play either pickleball or um, tennis. Um, but I know that there's passion around both of them. And I think that the thing that really impressed me and has impressed me uh, as I've been the liaison now for four years uh, from council uh, on the Parks and Recs board, and those uh, members have changed over that time. But all of the discussions that these individual citizens in our community, which are very diverse and representative across the board, they make as their reason for making a decision, it's based on how they can leverage the funds that the Parks and Recs has to serve the most people in our community. And that means from children in a lot of our uh, areas, with, which is Hall Gym, Miller Center, uh, City Park, all the way to our seniors who we want to be out, whether they're playing tennis on the tennis courts or whether they're playing pickleball on those same courts or at the Y. So I'm just extremely happy to report to you as the public that my observation, while I didn't vote and I can't vote, uh, on that board, I'm very proud of the deliberations that were carefully uh, considered, uh, and they did not rush into this uh, decision at all. In fact, this is the second time that that board has voted unanimously to do this project, and it was pulled because we needed to open it up to the public. And I think that this process is wonderful, and I really want to applaud both the tennis community and the pickleball community for the way that you have come and, and presented to council. Uh, it's been really important uh, process for us to learn. The way that I'm coming down on this is the same way that I watched carefully our <clears throat> Parks and Rec board deliberate. And I think that when we're asking, when we have six courts and we're asking for one-third of those courts to provide an opportunity for a segment of our uh, community, a demographic of our community that clearly are out there a lot playing this their uh, pickleball, and we're asking to make them permanent, not because it is convenient, but because there are women players who cannot haul these huge poles, they're metal poles that have to go into there. If you forever watch them trying to get them from their car to temporarily be there is the reason that we wanted to make these converting two of the tennis courts, leaving four for the tennis community. And I agree with everything that our other council members have had, have said in, in regard to we need to find in our budget where that we can support the um, staff for going for this USTA um, or grant 
where that we then do whatever we have to do to support the youth in our program. If that means that their requirement is that we rewind them for youth play, that's what we have to do. And that we commit to finding in our budget somewhere if we have to give up something else to be able to resurface all of these courts so that the tennis players who are playing on the four courts are playing on the best conditions and the same conditions that the pickleball players on the pickleball courts are playing on. And I think right now, that's what we can do. We can't build another facility. We've checked into that process. So with that, I will call the question. I have a quick okay. math question. Sure. Okay. Today we have six city park pickleball courts available and three at Hall Gym, right? That's nine? And we have six tennis courts available, right? If we convert this, we'll still have nine pickleball courts available and four tennis courts. But we're losing two courts somehow. And just for clarification, in our industry, mm -hmm. we would say six pickleball courts. If it's not, it'd be like if we had backboards over at Sports Complex and said you had to bring your own rim, we wouldn't say we had basketball courts. We wouldn't count those as courts. Right. We'd say they're temporary because you're bringing your own rim. But for permanent, we'd say we'd have six pickleball courts. So if they're shared, are they permanent or they're not permanent? Well, you mean if they're built permanent? Well, when we say permanent, we mean that the poles are in the ground. Okay. Um, but that's where we've talked before about making them convertible. You know, the pool, we've, we've discussed at an advisory board, pulling them out if there was a tournament of some sort. And the courts could be converted back for the so tournament. sharing. Back to the for, so for current, sharing. So for currently sharing. the six pickleball courts at City Park, mm -hmm. there are no pickleball nets. It's just the lines. Right. So you could still go out and play tennis because the tennis court, the tennis nets are there. So like Mayor was just saying, if you want to play pickleball, you have to bring your own net. Right. Yes, we've They're seen heavy. one here. Yeah, we've seen that. So, but if they share them, could the city still provide the net so that people don't have to bring their nets out? Do you see what I'm asking? Well, but then it would require that we had staff to go out and put the nets in for every time that somebody plays. And that's... We can leave the nets available so people could access the nets and... Yeah, but the problem is that they're heavy and you've got to carry the nets. If you're a woman playing... I mean, you've seen how big these nets are, and they're heavy. So well, I'm sure some of the pickleball ladies here would argue they could carry those nets as good as some of these guys, <laughs> well, right? I, I, since yeah. we're talking about so, nets. So you, you, you think that they're superior in you in carrying these nets? I, I wonder if I could just call for the question and we can move to a vote. I think yes. we all have an idea of where we stand on this. Yeah. It's, we don't have a vote scheduled on our agenda. Nope. But um, I'm just that asking was, for clarity. Okay. We did not put it on here because it's actually not required. We can move forward and let the um, vote of the Parks and Recs board be the vote. I understood that council wanted to come back and hear it all again and discuss it and that we as a council would make the final decision. So that is why that we're approaching it this way. So it is at your pleasure because we can either go with the recommendation, which is how it works um, in many of our other boards, um, or we can call the question here if Mr. Miller wants to do that, and we can vote. If we call for the question, that, that's the question of whether or not we want to end debate. So I would, I would call for the question. So this we... This is not the vote. This is the end of the debate. End of the debate. Okay. So now we have the end of the debate. So how do we, have, we how? have to vote on that? So do we want to end the debate? The, the debate. Robert rules. Yes. Call the question. There's no vote. Yeah. On. There's, There's no vote on that. No. Just, boom! It stops. Okay. It's, All right. So you have stopped the debate. Stop the debate. All right. Then I'd like to make a motion. <coughs> we proceed with the Parks and Rec uh, Advisory Board's recommendation to convert these two tennis courts to six pickleball courts. I would like to further ask the city manager um, to um, bring back to us a plan whereby we allocate $25,000 from fund balance to toward the resurfacing of the remaining courts on the condition that we get the grants that have been mentioned as a matching 
contrib contribution to that work. So again, restating the, the, the motion that we proceed with your plan to redo that those two courts to create six pickleball courts. But we also look to allocate twenty five thousand from fund balance to be used as a match to to secure grants. If we don't get the grants, come back to us. Does that make sense? That's my motion. Motions on the floor. All those in favor, aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. What about opposed? <laughs> opposed? Yeah. One. Okay. Well, you would. Okay. Yeah. You didn't say anything, so. It right. Actually, I was waiting for the. Okay. Yeah, I was waiting for you to call for. So, if, if it's opposed, we have uh, yeah. one opposed. So. Um, thank you very much for everyone's input. Thank you, uh, staff, and uh, thank you, citizens, uh, for coming. We're going to move on now to. We're going to move on to item 10. Hope you get another hour, that last hour that he spoke. By the way, your sister. Oh, I do. She's <laughs> Wendy's trying to make it through the crowd. Mm. Folks, we've got a meeting to finish. If you could. Uh... Okay, we're going to continue our meeting. If we can have conversations in the lobby, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Wendy, you're up. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Um, back at the January 7th meeting, City Council adopted a resolution authorizing the upset bid process for the sale of the parcel you see outlined in Cyan in the 300 block of Grimm Street. This was advertised um, in the Salisbury Post uh, beginning Sunday, January 12th. There was a 10-day period open to receive upset bids and none were received. So now we're bringing it back to you um, to decide if you would like to have the, do the final sale. The offer was $3,500. Um, the parcel is owned by True Land Development LLC, who also owns the parcel directly beside this vacant parcel. Here you can see a street view picture. Um, the existing uh, parcel that they own is a two-story quadruplex. And I do want to point out that prior to True Land Development purchasing this property, um, according to Mike Attila, there were many violations, code violations. Since they've taken possession, um, there have been no violations, fines, or liens. Um, this is just a quick <coughs> summary of other um, undeveloped parcels that we have sold using the upset bid process. And if you look at this last column, this is the price per square foot. Um, this 300 block of Grimm Street is the one we are considering today. So it is um, within the. So if there are no questions, then council action, if you agree, would be to authorize the sale of parcel 005. 140-01, um, located in the 300 block of Grimm Street in the amount of $3,500. Okay. Council, do you have any questions? If not, do I have a motion? So moved. So we have a motion. All those in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. you notify them. Um, um, had a council person want to know whether or not, because of the late hour, do can we have the police department um, review delayed till the next meeting? Is that okay with you, Chief? Okay. All right. Uh, come play pickleball <laughs> to make up for the time you just spent. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it, Chief. Um, council to receive a presentation regarding various ways to participate in creating a vision um, 
for the forward 2040 comprehensive plan. Good evening, Council. Um, Catherine and I are very excited to be here tonight to share with you information about the 2040 uh, comprehensive plan, Forward 2040, and to highlight several opportunities that members of the community can take to participate in the process. Um, a comprehensive plan is a long-range policy guide to help shape priorities and inform decisions about land use, zoning, housing, transportation, essentially the um, future development of our city for the next 20 years. Um, and you'll be hearing a lot about this project over the course of the year. We expect it to take essentially all year to, to complete a complete draft. Um, so we've broken it into phases. Um, we are at the very beginning, in the red circle and the visioning stage. A vision statement um, provides an overall big picture guidance for the entire comprehensive plan and helps to determine how the city wants to grow and what it wants to be like in the next 20 years. Um, it helps to the goals and policies that fill out kind of the, the meat of the plan all need to relate back to this vision statement. So it's a very important aspect of the plan. And I think very importantly, it, it is also supposed to reflect broad participation of the community. So um, with that in mind, we, uh, Catherine and I, along with the members of our steering committee, have developed two activities um, to, to help to accomplish that. Um, we had the activities uh, in the lobby this evening. Um, they are, we've got boards over there. Do you want to show them off, Catherine? Um, the first activity is called the Big Ideas Activity, and it's intended to help to establish kind of high-level community priorities as we look ahead. Um, you can see there are different themes, um, including economic development, environmental sustainability, community character. And um, while all of these things are important, we're asking people to rank some of their most important ideas and some of the less important ideas, just to get a sense of overall priority and emphasis for the plan. Um, it also generates a lot of questions and a lot of discussion um, that are, of course, beneficial. Um, so the second activity is called the Big Picture um, activity, and it's intended to begin a conversation about places that might need to change and evolve or remain the same in Salisbury. And this will help us to eventually create kind of a growth development framework and a future <coughs> land use map. Um, our goal was to make these uh, two activities pretty um, quick, <coughs> easy, accessible for, for members of the community. So again, we could cast our net really wide. Um, with that in mind, we've developed three different ways for people to um, kind of go through each of these different activities. Um, so the first one is obviously an online survey. Um, I will say that our online survey is a little bit delayed. Our hope was to have it rolled out by tonight. We're trying to make the mapping exercise accessible to those who are visually impaired, and that's taken a little longer than, than we would have liked. So we're hoping by next week it will be available online to take at our website. Um, and then the next two um, we want to talk about in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to turn it over to Catherine to talk about our meeting in a box idea. We have developed the meeting in a box kit for um, our community and our activities here. It's not a new concept. A lot of communities do meeting in a box for planning. Um, so if you have a neighborhood group or want to invite your friends over and have and call us for a box, we'd be happy to put one together for you. We have all the information available in both English and Spanish. Um, so when you get your box, we will have it prepared with the number of dots based off of the number of people you're inviting to your um, event. Uh, they're labeled, they're color-coded. We've tried to make it as easy as possible for everyone else. Um, we've got little giveaways to thank you for your participation. Um, we've got uh, a welcome letter to the host thanking them um, for participating and then also in reiterating the importance of this and their participation in our plan. We've got sample ground rules for discussion so that it, everybody's on their best behavior. Uh, we've got instructions and follow-up questions for both activities, both the big picture and the big ideas exercise. Um, we've also got a sign-in sheet trying to capture just the number of people who participated. If they want to leave their, their contact information and stay involved, they can, but that's not required. And then, of course, 
we have all of the posters that you see here, they're folded up, and we've developed another one that's blank, that's big ideas and priorities. So if there's just ideas or comments that people want to record, they have a place to do that. They can pack it all back up in the box and return it to us. So it's pretty simple. It's a great idea. Oh, gosh, yeah. That's Love it. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, we, we are a small staff um, with few resources, so the idea is that, you know, people can host their meetings on their own. We're asking our steering committee members to also host meetings, and we invite you all to host meetings as well, um, and anybody else here in the audience or at home. That is so innovative and creative. Yeah, very creative. Mm -hmm. um, also, we have um, the Neighborhood Alliance mm -hmm. group, so are they going to be uh, Yeah, so there? we actually, we went to the Neighborhood Alliance group when they met in January, um, and we did this activity with them and told them about the meeting in a box and told them, you know, that it would be available at the end of January, which it has been. Okay, very good. Thank we you. We ought to give one to every one of our boards and commissions and ask them yes. to do it. Mm -hmm. Any of those groups that we're working with already, um, you would think they'd be interested in giving us feedback. That would be great. Um, the, the final, uh, well, not the final, but another way uh, to participate is kind of in person what we're calling pop-in meetings. Um, we have five that are scheduled, um, and you can see them listed on the screen. Um, our intent was to kind of vary them from place to place around the community. Um, and in particular, our, we wanted to go to certain locations where people were, where it was convenient for people to go. So the La Alcancia grocery store will be there from 6 to 8 on February 24th. Um, Salisbury Customer Service Center, if you're paying your water bill, you can stop in and give us your feedback at that point as well, in several of the other locations. And as you, as you can see, I mean, it was easy enough for us to set it up here tonight, so there are plenty of other opportunities for us to, to go um, um, speak with members of the community directly. Um, I was going to ask if, because um, this is such a great idea and can fit so many communities, could we include something in there about the census 2020? Yes, that's because our, that really will go to. That's wonderful idea. Yes, we can we can add certainly add things to the box about the census. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Because yeah, that is a great idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, idea. It, yeah. it's so timely mm -hmm. with what we're doing and when it's going to. Yeah. Be. Do you have a time frame on? Like, how long are you going to be collecting this information? That's a great question. So, um, you know, boxes are ready to be uh, picked up now. Um, just call um, Catherine with that information. I've got her contact information right there. Um, we are looking to collect information over the next two months. I think we're looking to have the boxes returned by the end of March. Good morning. Have you had a chance to ask any of the schools when they are doing their open houses and uh, would they be willing to have some of these boxes when they have all their parents and, and students there? That's a great uh, that's a great comment as well. Um, one of the things that we've tasked our steering committee with doing is to create a key audiences and stakeholders um, spreadsheet, essentially, where we've identified certain populations that we really want to reach out to and try to hit, and then brainstorm people and organizations that are already in place that we can contact and say, um, can you hand me that sheet? Just send them this, which I believe you might have at your desk, um, which shows you all the different ways that you can participate um, and has our contact information. And so this is easy enough to say, I have a contact at the schools. Will you please um, look at this and consider participating? So again, we're just trying to cast the net as wide as possible. And uh, you know, I know that Overton and Knox, because I've attended, they have parent uh, coffee uh, meetings, mm -hmm. and they have people who come and present. A man up Monday was there today. Um, but that would be another great place, mm -hmm. because you've got parents and their children, and it would be a great exercise for the kids to get involved in, mm -hmm. too. So I'll make sure that the two uh, contacts I have at Knox and Overton know. Thank you. That's both. all we have. For you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great idea. Good. Great idea. Okay. Um, okay, and I'm I'm going to ask uh, council again uh, as far as um, 
Do you want to go ahead <clears throat> with uh, considering all the appointments to various boards and commissions? Uh, Kelly Baker, do you have a, an opinion on this? Do we need to do this today? <laughs> okay. Are you all ready today? I have one. Okay. If, if you want to go ahead with the one, then. Um, the Community Appearance Commission um, will have four uh, needs. However, we do have three of these who are eligible for reappointment. Uh, I have discussed with these members as in, in the Community <coughs> Appearance Commission. Um, so I would request um, your all's approval to reappoint Reg Boland, William Mason, and Chris McNeely. We have a motion. All those in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Mayor, anyone else? I, I, sure. Point, it's not boards and commissions. I'm sorry. I had one of the. I just wanted to remind you of something. Okay. Uh, I got an email, uh, text message during the meeting from Pete Teague, who asked me to ask you to announce Founders Day. Okay. You know. I'll do that at my at Mayor's comment. Okay. Thank you. Um. Okay, so uh, we will then uh, address the rest of them at our next meeting, uh, if that's okay with council. I, I do have one question about okay, the, the sure. alternative methods of design commission. I think um, been, that's been pulled in the planning board, I think. Um, so I'm not sure we have a liaison there unless it's maybe me. Um, Rodney Queen uh, is not eligible for reappointment. Just throw that out there. We won't make any decision tonight, but he's pretty is valuable. He, is he uh, willing to continue? I'll reach out to him. I, okay. don't, I don't know. That would be good because if he is, I, I would agree with you. Okay. That would be good. Any other one from council that you're sure about tonight? Okay. Then we'll move on to um, the city attorney i'm going to i had on our agenda the uh, resolution of but i believe you have some information that you need to uh, give council before we take this up so please not, not commenting at all on the merits of that i think each of you individually would support that but as a council we are limited by state law in our ability to adopt a referendum uh, in support or in opposition to any political um, issue or candidate so I don't think we as a council can adopt that particular resolution again I'm not saying anything about the merits of the particular resolution uh, just the legality of council adopting it that considered a political it's, it falls in the statute of um, use of public funds in support of a candidate and arguably having a public meeting and spending money to convene this is could be seen as the use of public funds that's, so that's individually Never mind. Okay. So uh, we we then will remove this item from um, our um, agenda, and council will not act on this. Um, I can just continue on with my attorney yes, report. Yes, please, okay. please do. Uh, the first thing on my report is just to I got two things. One is to adopt a tank maintenance uh, or contract, a resolution to terminate our. Salisbury Road and Utilities tank maintenance agreements. There's about 15 of these contracts that date back to the 90s that we've um, either entered into on our behalf or inherited from the um, municipalities that we work with, China Grove and Granite Quarry. Uh, they have various termination provisions in them. All of them are similar. Some require council action. Some allow require the mayor to take action. Some require the manager to take action. I'm just asking council to adopt this resolution to authorize the city manager to terminate these contracts. This does not. Um, say anything about the quality of work that the contractor is providing. It's just an effort for Salisbury Run Utilities to clean up the way they're doing it. So they want to have the engineer that they've approved to recommend what maintenance is needed. And when they get that maintenance recommendation, and none of them are here to talk about it, but I'll do my best. When they get that recommendation from the engineer, then they will bid that out according to city policy for the, in, for the particular work. So all I need from you is just um, the resolution. Yeah. I can make a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to send a notice to Utility Services Company, Inc., to terminate existing contracts. We have a motion. All those in favor, aye. 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 
Thank you. And the second matter I have is just an update to council of something you approved in closed session a while back about a workers' compensation settlement, the matter of Kenneth Keller versus the city of Salisbury and the North Carolina League of Municipalities. And just to inform you that that matter has settled for $110,000 and a release of liability um, from the city. That's all that I have for my report. And we need no action. No, we don't That's need action for that. Okay. City manager? I have nothing at this time. Um, Mayor's announcements. Downtown Salisbury, Inc. will host the 7th Annual Wine About Winter event Friday, February 7th, 2020, from 5 p.m. until 9 p.m. in downtown Salisbury. Tickets are $22.50 in advance or 30 on the day of the event. To purchase tickets or for additional information, visit www.downtownsalisburync.com or call 704-637-7814. Uh, at this time, we'll entertain any uh, Founders Day. Um, I'd like to announce on behalf of Pete Teague an invitation to this Thursday 10 a.m. Uh, they will have a convocation in the auditorium and you are invited uh, as council if you can make it. So if you all will individually. Luncheon at one. Yes, luncheon at one. And if you can um, go ahead and individually um, respond if you can come so they'll be prepared. I've already RCP that I will be out of town, so I regret my regrets. I think, uh, also, uh, she couldn't go. I think I'm the only man standing, and he okay. asked. He was, I guess, I mean, he needs somebody from city to bring greetings. Yes, thank you. If you I'll could do take that. my big greeting sign and say, Here. Okay. Um, then we're down to number 21. Um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? I would like to go oh, back to oh, number 18. Me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I. Council comments. Council comments. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Um, I have just a couple. Okay. Um, uh, just for clarity in the pickleball versus tennis, I voted yes thanks to Mr. Miller's um, foresight to help us find a compromise. I agree it's the right thing to do, that we need to do it all. Uh, I appreciate everybody on this. Um, I appreciate the donors. appreciate both communities for being involved. I know it seems um, tiresome sometimes for both sides. We've all said that. Uh, I especially want to thank the Parks and Rec team, the whole team. Uh, I know that you all have felt like for a year that you were in a lose-lose situation. Uh, but I hope that you realized it's a win-win. And no one has ever doubted the ability of Parks and Rec. No one in this room who was either for or against, whatever. We all can walk away. And I, and I want you and your team to know that. Um, and then just one last thing. Um, I'm going to read this. I had the honor of speaking to one of our citizens today, and he left me with many self-reflections. I want to share with everyone what this kind, genuine, and insightful man had to say. He asked that we all be kind that we all be accepting, and that we all be forgiving. This man is probably not long for this world, and he wanted our whole community to know those things. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, Any other? I know it's late, and so I'll be real quick. I just, uh, two things. One is, I got this notice in the mail. It's addressed to me. I'm called local postal customer. Um, it says water update, and it says they've been unable to contact me to please call this number. Uh, I'm sure some of you have the same address as I do, local postal customer, and received them. And I just want the public to know that what they're doing is they're trying to sell water filtration systems. When you call that number, what they say is that <clears throat> given the fact that <clears throat> Your, there are problems with your water system and, and the health of your water, please, we would like to talk to you about something or other. And I said, you know, my response, of course, was, I have no concerns about my water. We've got great water. And I said, thank you very much. So I'm going to hang up, which is exactly what I did. But I don't want the public to think that because they're getting this, this is a for-profit company, 
you know, that's sending one to every resident in the city trying to get them to buy a water filtration system through a, a fear tactic. That's the first thing. Um, Lane, I'll give this to you because he wanted a copy of that. The other thing is, is I, I think the mayor, and, and I talked about this a little bit, but we went to the mayor's innovation conference in Washington, and I don't want to uh, belabor this, but there were some really, and, and we, it's too easy to go to a conference and come back and keep whatever it is we learned and not share it with the public. And but So I'll be very brief. The Mayor's Innovation Conference, which is a very unique conference, it covers three topics. And this year, uh, the three uh, topics were designing for extremes was one of the issues, which is about uh, how uh, cities deal with, you know, citizens potentially on the edge. And there were a number of speakers. One of the best ones was Mayor Mitch Colvin from Fayetteville, whose idea was what Fayetteville's doing with regard to their homeless problem is they're building what are called tiny houses, where you can get four to six houses per acre. And um, it's been reasonably successful. Um, and um, I actually mentioned it to Tina Grubb, um, and they've got some land, you know, there. So it, it's just a, it, it's another alternative in the affordable housing realm. The, these are houses between 150 and 500 square feet. Uh, there was another mayor there in a different part of the program, the mayor of Athens, Georgia, who, which has a, a, a look very similar to Salisbury, poverty rates, you know, approaching 30, the um, um, unemployment rates three and a half, there's a lot of working poor. They're attacking their um, affordable housing with, I uh, mean, there'll be beat back on this, but they, they've added a special purpose sales tax. They've added a half a cent to the sales tax that comes to the city, and they're going to raise $45 million um, over the next 10 years. Uh, they've, they've got 20 acres that they can use for development. And so there's some creative ideas out there is, is my point. So I'll just throw that out there. The other, there was a session on the 2020 census, which we're all familiar with. And, and finally, two other things. One is uh, the third session was something that the, the mayor has been championing, which is about um, looking at different ways to deal with uh, cradle to preschool uh, kids, and that was uh, was a, a good session. Uh, finally, the mayor of Oakland, California, had um, a uh, interesting thing where um, she and, and the mayor pointed this out at the um, at the retreat. But there is a uh, website called Kiva, which is a microloan situation where you, pe uh, people that need small loans, I think the maximum is about $10,000, they go online and they say, you know, I need this money for this amount. She walked up there to speak. She said, look, I'm going to lend somebody $25. She hit the button. She loaned that $25. She had loaned out about uh, a little over $4,000 over the last year. She's gotten repaid 92% of it. She says it's a it's a great vehicle in a town that where you have little entrepreneurs that need a little bit of money to get their business started and people from all over the world, and especially in your city, will jump in. What the one thing it does need is, is it needs a sponsor, and the sponsor investments twenty five thousand dollars. And some cities are acting as a sponsor, or they're going to a foundation and trying to get the sponsor so they can create it, so that then their citizens uh, that have small businesses can jump into this. Uh, well, uh, one of the things Jamel Black talked about uh, during his campaign last uh, fall was that there, he told me there are probably 50 small businesses, uh, entrepreneurs in uh, the uh, minority neighborhoods in town that their biggest issue is lack of capital. So we need to, instead of letting that idea die, you and I need to, you know, knock our heads together and figure out how to, you know, maybe finance that to help get it started locally. And um, thank you very much. I just I just wanted to get those ideas out there so they don't just die completely. Thank you, David. Okay, so we are now at a, unless did, did Brian was Brian. Did you? I make a motion we go into closed session to discuss a personnel matter. Well, I had a comment. Yeah. Okay. Wait yeah, a minute. Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem had a yeah, comment for your comments. Uh, I just want to just lift up the fact that I think the council did uh, some incredible work for our retreat. Um, I just want to thank the staff for all the work that you put into helping us get prepared for our retreat and 
Lane, what you did. Uh, and Karen, I just want to offer my condolences again and the loss of your brother um, and, and just uh, give you a kudos for, for being here tonight because um, that's never very easy. So thank you. Um, so I will forego any other comments except a big thank you to staff, all of you from top to bottom. Um, you did a phenomenal job at goal setting. And council, thank you because you all did a great job. Uh, I think we, we have a great team. Uh, so now we will. Motion we go into closed session to discuss a personnel matter. I would like to suggest that a motion be amended to add an attorney client privilege conversation as well. Accept the amendment. Okay. All those in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries. Hannah, yeah, no. before you leave, could I ask you a real quick question?
Um, so no action was taken um, in our closed session. Motion uh, to adjourn. Um, all those in favor, aye. 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 Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. You know, what Brian did tonight was interesting.